Number 10. No calling, no gifts. This is a time in history when men were told to be gentlemen and women told to be ladies. Naturally, that came with some weird social practices. For instance, women were discouraged from accepting gifts from men. Personally, I like to give my girlfriend flowers and chocolate. I'm a classic guy, what can I say? Can't go wrong with that. However, even if a handsome silver tongued devil such as myself were to give some flowers and the finest dark chocolate a 7 Eleven has to offer, and a most promising woman were to accept said gifts, she may not be able to call me back. Literally, because well, the phone isn't exactly a thing yet, and also because that's something else women were just discouraged from doing. <laughs> Call on a man? No way, Jose, even if he is super nice and waiting for a genuine response. One etiquette guidebook from 1882 called any woman who calls on a man ill bred and positively improper to do so. I like when people give me flowers and chocolate. Maybe call me sometimes. I'm a little lonely. Number nine, act like a lady. How dare ladies do anything unladylike? Ugh, said every man ever in the Victorian era. This is a time in history when ladies gotta be ladylike. That means makeup, corsets, and, and don't you dare do anything masculine. Ugh, that's me angry. This is still a time when food isn't the greatest either, so imagine if you got an upset tummy at the dinner table. Happens to me a lot. You've got a handsome prince that your parents have arranged for you to marry. When you go to greet him, you do it with a simple gesture as kneeling to curtsy could turn your linens a certain shade of embarrassment that 1800 stain cleaning technology could never wash away. You'd poop yourself. Where's Billy Mays when you need him, right? How dare a woman do such things as go number two, or even worse, break wind? Oh, the nerve. That's just the way it went, folks. I don't make the rules. Number eight, charged with love. Naturally, this was the past, and not being open to homosexuality was just the way it was, especially when tucking yourself into bed at night alone wasn't allowed either. Homosexuality just wasn't gonna happen. They, they just weren't gonna be approved of it. It's just how it goes. It sucks. However, it's almost as if there's been love on this earth since day one, and to stop that kind of love, it's just silly, man. Wherever I go, everyone is welcome on this channel or my Twitch. Chetty loves everyone, because in reality, this is a time period where you could wind up in jail for that kind of love. And as Awesome Powers would say, that's just not very groovy, baby, yeah. Strangely enough, homosexual relationships between women might have been completely overlooked, as they were sometimes mistaken for women being friends. Yeah, I know. Some women even lived together. But given that they probably needed each other for financial support, people just kind of thought that's how it went, and they ignored it. It's like they live together, and you start putting the pieces together, and it's like, you know, they, I don't know, something weird going on there. But love everybody, come on, be nice. Number seven, a good thing. If I'm talking about medieval times, there's a good chance I'm gonna bring up the super not cool, not fun, do not condone or support the behavior of marrying a woman at the age of 12. Yucky. In part one, I mentioned that there was a ton of corners and streets being worked by the only other job besides street cleaners at 3 a.m. by women. However, after venereal disease was becoming a serious issue, it was getting pretty bad. It was becoming clear that a lot of people who were getting sick were young women. Like, 11 to 16 age group. Oof. Which I shouldn't have to tell you is bad. That, that's pretty bad, dude. When I was 16, I was rocking Black Ops 2, hanging out with my buddies, and partying hard in the summer. I got a lot of good stories. Maybe I'll share them one day. Catching all that nasty stuff is no way to spend your youth. So thank God the government changed the age of consent to 16 years old, which I know is not a solution for everything that was going on, but it was a small step forward in the right direction. That's what we like. Good history moving forward. We like that. Chetty likes. Number six, the seam seamstress. Being that the industrial revolution had started and business was booming, people needed to travel for business. Or more specifically, men needed to travel for business. Which means they gotta be away from their wives, and that means they are away from the very thing we're talking about today. Bedroom stuff. How did men solve this issue? Well, there was no shortage of ladies roaming street corners to uh, aid in, in that matter. However, there's an option with a little less syphilis. There were AIDS or early blow-up dolls called travel ladies. Strangely enough, it was stored in a gentleman's hat. What? That's so wrong. Once it was ready to be used, it was inflated and reassembled. This is a quote from an ad from one of the products. It is inflated to the essential part of the woman wanted by a man. 
That just, that just doesn't sound very good. This is why we have boards of people to check stuff from products before it gets shipped out to the public. I feel like that just wouldn't fly very well today. Number five, big polluter. This just doesn't make any sense. It never did to me, and it still doesn't. But in case you didn't know, self-pleasure was a big no-no, commonly called self-pollution, which honestly is very funny to me. That's just hilarious. Don't self-pollute yourself, Chris. That's bad. Don't do that. That's naughty. It was a sin and thought to be a cause for many ailments. I'm sure you've heard the classic saying that for guys, if you decided to go bump in the night by yourself, there's a good chance you'd need a walking stick because it would make you go blind. Women were also targeted, however, as for any pearl polishing by women was thought to be hysteric and needed to be treated for such. Look, the truth is, any man who wants to wax his chair or woman tuning a one dial radio should be able to do so without judgment of society or medical remedies of snake oil doctors. Love yourself, love everybody else, and just, as long as the bedroom doors close, you're good. Just, just don't do it in public, you're good. Number four, shake and bake. I'm something of a scientist myself, but that doesn't mean I know everything. And if you actually need to learn something about health and safety, take it from a professional, not a second rate John Candy. However, when coming across this fact, I just had to share it. Cause with my medical knowledge, this just doesn't sound right. All right, so kids, we know how they're made. I don't need to go into detail for that. However, there was this idea back in the Victorian days that if a woman danced shortly after doing what mommy and daddies do, then there was a chance that her pregnancy just wouldn't happen. Or perhaps more commonly after riding a horse. S same idea, uh, okay. Which is frankly, horse. I mean, come on, my mom always told me when she was baking that I had to be quiet and stop running around the house or the cake she was baking wouldn't rise. Well, they always did, and I love chocolate cake. I mean, really, I do. I'm starting to wonder if there's a connection here. I was a rowdy kid. Number three, the Kensington system. Poor Queen Victoria. I know this is kind of a stretch, but it relates back to the whole mistreating women thing. But basically, it was something implemented in order to control the young royal, make her dependent on her mother, whom she was not allowed to be without. Basically, modern day strict parents. Now, all the kids watching right now, or all the kids who've grown up, how well did that parenting work? Let us know in the comments. I'm willing to bet it created a little bit of a divide between parent and child, am I right? That's exactly what happened with Queen Victoria. Shouldn't be surprised, really. Being a parent is tough. I get that. But squeeze too hard and the sand falls through the cracks of your hand. Victoria wasn't even allowed an hour to herself. And I don't care who you are, no matter how charismatic or bubbly, everybody needs some alone time. Number two, a healthy breakfast. Okay, not Victorian London, but this is just too funny not to mention, and it's around the same time period, very close. As the great minds of the time thought, self-pollution was a big no-no, and the reason for these urges was often related to food. Some thought eating meat would make you down bad, so a man named John Harvey Kellogg, you might have heard of him, aimed to cure the sickness of self-love. What if a man had a delicious, nutritious meal to eat, especially at the start of his day. Cornflakes by Kellogg's, the, the very same cereal that's probably sitting on top of your fridge, yeah, was partially originally designed to stop you from feeling those carnal urges. Now, not sure if that works. I mean, go ahead and tell me how you feel after eating a bowl of that. I had one this morning. I feel fine. I don't feel any different at all. I mean, I'm just, well, not really feeling the same about Pam Anderson anymore, though. Number one, rising action. This could get some married couples into some trouble if they're watching, so sorry. It's gonna be hard to talk about this without saying it because YouTube will send a stern letter if I do, but here it goes. The deed was not considered done unless both parties had signed off on it, uh, had their toes curled, reaching the peak, your magnum opus, the way I feel when I eat at McDonald's, DEFCON 1, or simply mispronouncing organisms in health class. I feel like once you're involved, you're involved. And to me, that's a done deal. You can't really reverse it from that point on, regardless of any of my euphemisms. But that's what they thought. They thought if you didn't, you both didn't climb that mountain together, it didn't happen. Because science. Kicking off the list at number 10, a lot of hair. To kick off this wild part two, I had to include the tale of the woman who ate her own hair. 
Why did she do it? What happened? How much hair? Well, let's find out. All the questions about to be answered. The Liverpool Daily Post back in 1869 got the attention of those passerbyers with this one. A 30 year old passed away in the village of Lincolnshire. That's not too far off from the average life expectancy of the 1800s, but this case, this case was a little odd. Something was off about it. So doctors asked the family if they could carry out a post mortem, and lo and behold, a two pound solid chunk of hair was sitting in her stomach. It caused ulcerations of the stomach and ultimately caused her death. What a horrible way to go out. The woman's sister didn't know that over the last dozen years or so, she had been casually eating her own hair. Just one piece every now and then. Ultimately, it added up. If you know anybody that's eating their own hair, pass this on. Send them this video. This sounds rather uncomfortable. Number nine, cat attack. If I have to pick, I would say I'm 100% a dog guy. Cats are cool, don't get me wrong, but this next story freaks me out a bit. Also, I had a cat once and I pulled its tail on it. <laughs> pissed at me and scratched me and scared the life out of me. So, dog, dogs for sure. Back in 1870, a rich woman had put her time, energy, and resources into cat breeding. What a fun little hobby and lifestyle. She had tons of cats, she loved them all equally, and they loved her. I'm allergic also, so this story is my nightmare on a level. But it does sound like a cute time, I'll admit, that's a nice way. Especially like in the Victorian era, what a, what a lovely little pocket of fun. 1800s, a lot of candles, everything being extremely flammable, disaster hit often in Victorian times. And in 1870, a fire broke out of this young woman's home, and the cats were sadly trapped in the house. They made it out alive, but by the time they made it out, the two maids that had kicked the door open to rescue them, they had gone full primal. The cats just attacked them and it was all bad. The fire in the house had obviously scared them, so when the doors were open, these two maids were both attacked by them at full force, essentially. All of these cats. Like, what a horrible thank you for saving all of their lives, you know what I mean? Number eight, quick divorce. Let's just say the love thing isn't working out, okay? It happens, people change, but now what? Say it's the Victorian era, but divorce in England isn't allowed until 1857, and it's 1856. So now what are we gonna do? Well, considering what list we're on and which part it is, it's pretty wildly unfair. If you were the wife, you were getting sold in this scenario. How horrible is that? Wife sellers, they were a thing. That was a legitimate business, how horrible. Yeah, you were getting sold if you were the wife. How horrible is that? Wife sellers was a legitimate business. There were auctions, public auctions would be done. You would watch people bid on marrying your wife. At like noon, middle of the day, people are walking by like, oh, do I have any change, hang on. This is insane. One real sale that happened in 1862 was in Selby. The asking price was a beer. The asking price for this person's wife was one pint. Sold, just like that, that's crazy. Sold, drank, now I'm married. That's insane. Other times, most of the time, it was a rather expensive exchange. I feel like there are plenty of cases where this would honestly be the ideal scenario. Just get it done in one day, whatever, peace. See you again, bye, you're the worst. Number seven, the Great Famine. We're gonna lean out of wife selling for a hot minute and include the boys for this one. Yeah, come on back in, you're all guilty. The Great Famine took out everybody, not just Victorian women, of course. Back in 1845, potato crop that a lot of the Irish population was relying on was no longer available all of a sudden. A group of microorganisms just wiped them out, just like that, and in result, around one million folks died or had to leave. It was draconian law and British ruling that made the exported food hard to reach people that really needed it. So this famine led to Irish independence and anti-union movements. A little fun bit of history I had to include on this one. Number six, the Brooklyn Theater Stampede. And we're back to absolute horribleness. Here we go. I love the theater. When the pandemic shut down plays, I actually felt pretty sad. I like sitting in full rooms watching a guy in a fake wig monologue about Mozart. Like that's my ideal Saturday night. That's the best. I don't want that to not be a thing anymore. I love theater. But today we have an obnoxious amount of distractions that can take you out of the experience. Guy's texting, fighting his ex-girlfriend two rows ahead of me. I'm trying to watch Joseph and the amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. I'm like, man, it's not the same anymore. Theater's not the same anymore. Turn off your phone, throw a tomato at him. It can be distracting. Exit signs can also be pretty distracting, but we need them. We definitely need them. Because in 1876, the Brooklyn Theater caught fire after a single lantern fell over on stage during a performance. This was 1876. Everybody was wearing flammable attire. There aren't emergency exits yet. A fire marshal hadn't come in and counted heads at this point, so it was a disaster. 278 people lost their lives. A monument was put up after the incident. It shook the town, it was absolutely horrible. I read about this and I was like, that's horrible. We got included in, this is a horrible list. Number five, 
the hobble skirt. Yeah, so when people can't get out of burning theaters, it's stuff like this to blame. Just from this 1910 headline alone, I'm glad we don't have hobble skirts anymore. The June 12, 1910 headline reads, The hobble skirt is the latest freak in women's fashions. The latest freak. Skirts that are so tight around the ankle that locomotion is seriously impeded and speed is impossible. Nice. I'll take two, debit. Doesn't that sound like a bad time? Why would anyone want this? Sounds like you're gonna be late for everything. French designer Paul Poirier made these to free the bust, to free the, you know, have a lot of room in here, whilst shackling the legs. So you, in turn, have to, you can't move. Just what you need to move around uneven stone roads, I guess. Love the practicality on this one, Paul, thanks. Despite how ridiculous and unsafe the hobble skirt looks and acts, only the wealthy could afford such a thing. Shoot, oh man, must be nice. I'll just be over here wearing jeans like an idiot. Middle and lower class women wore skirts with slits or buttons so they could, you know, actually walk around. Yeah, what fools. Oh, sorry, you want a button? <laughs> I don't speak broke, sweetie. Number four, lead based. When I started here at the studio a year and a half ago, maybe two years, I was like, okay, I gotta put on face cream maybe. A lot, of, a lot of lights, a lot of HD this. Time to get rid of these bags under my eyes finally. I don't know, maybe drink some water. See what happens. Finding a skincare routine of any sorts is easy now, dare I say. The lovely World Wide Web has our back. You can learn how to draw your eyebrows on while listening to true crime. It's wonderful where we are today. But the cosmetic game, whew, back in the 18th century, not great. Turns out, wasn't that great. Not that safe. RuPaul's Drag Race would have been a lethal sport, know what I mean? Back in the 18th century, lead mixed with vinegar was often used to make your face look, you know, more pale. The Victorian look, I guess, gotta have those veins pop out. A splash of sulfur for those freckles. Horrible idea. Queen Elizabeth I used cosmetics containing lead, mercury, and or arsenic. The same poison that took out George III and Napoleon Bonaparte. So, not safe at all in any time, period. In fact, arsenic was on the priority list of hazardous substances, and toxic metal exposure is still an issue we're facing in this era, let alone Victorian. Number three, the Kensington system. Ah, oh, this was horrible. Queen Victoria was brought up under the Kensington system, which if you haven't heard of before is awful. I was grounded more often than not growing up, I'll admit, you know, I was the youngest of three, so I tried some shady stuff every now and then, but this, this is another level. At least I could go to the washroom without supervision, you know what I mean? Yeah, buckle up. Victoria's mother, Duchess Victoria of Kent, she created this Kensington system to control her daughter. She literally isolated the child from friends, family members, anybody, everybody, you name it. Her mother would monitor her every action on top of this, including who she can see or speak to, if there were any of those people at some point. Victoria only had two playmates growing up her entire life. She had her half-sister, Princess Fiodora of Lenigan, and then the Duchess attendant, Sir John Conroy, his daughter, Victoria. I mean, I had like four friends growing up, you know, maybe five, five and a half, but this is just cruel, this is just unfair. Especially with a royalty too, you'd think you can have more things. No, less. She shared a room with her mother until she was a queen. That entire time, she literally couldn't walk down the hallway alone. Victoria has reflected on her childhood, and yeah, in case you're wondering, she hates John Conrad. She referred to him as a demon incarnate, so she's got the words. Number two, arsenic dresses. If looks could kill, literally. You've heard of arsenic and old lace at some point, but what exactly are we talking about? Back in 1861, a poet by the name of Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, real name, his wife, Fanny, also real name, her dress caught on fire and her burns were so bad that of course she sadly didn't survive. But this was sadly common in Victorian days. Puffy dresses, open candles as we heard earlier. These dresses back then, they were flammable as is, but some of them were made with literal poison. Some of them had arsenic made to have that like green look, like the real arsenic green look. It wasn't just in clothing either. Back in 1861, an artificial flower maker named Matilda Schurer used green arsenic laced powder and her fingernails had turned green and green foam started coming out of her mouth and it was just a horrible way to go out. Arsenic's not supposed to be inhaled, let alone worn. Although yeah, it did look nice for a hot minute. Not worth it. And finally, number one, Queen Victoria's threats. Being the queen and all, and we're talking about the Victorian era, I figured we'd end with this one. Being the queen and all, a security team is always needed, and during her reign, there were multiple, multiple attempts to harm the young queen. The first attack was back in 1840. It was an 18-year-old man named Edward Oxford, and he fired towards the queen's carriage, but obviously and luckily missed. But when Edward was accused of high treason, he was actually found not guilty. 
due to insanity. Then a couple years later, in 1842, it happened again. This time, two men fired at her. They were found guilty. In 1849, her carriage was attacked by William Hamilton. In 1850, as the carriage was passing the gates of Buckingham Palace, Robert Pate, a retired soldier, ran up and hit her with his cane. Victoria was okay, thankfully, but of course, she was shook. Then again in 1842, 1849, and 1872, attempt after attempt. But then things got a little worse. If you haven't heard of Boy Jones or anything that happened here, I saved it for last because it's extremely unsettling. A teenager stalked the Queen back in 1838 until 1841. Edward Jones, aka Boy Jones. This guy somehow managed to break into Buckingham Palace more than once. It was some Assassin's Creed type stuff. He just knew some back way, he climbed some window or whatever. The guy just knew it revved in, so he would break in and would more often than not just hide under the Queen's sofa. He would sit on her throne sometimes and one of the worst things ever, he would go through her drawers and like go through her clothes and stuff. It was creepy. He would steal her clothes until eventually and thankfully he got caught. Of all the things you can do, of all the crimes you want to commit in the Victorian era, you're going to go hide under a couch for five years? Okay, I'm glad he got caught, but just so weird. What a weird ending. Number 10, Boy Jones. What's more intimate than a stalker? Am I right, ladies? If there's one thing women have loved throughout history, it's having every second of their privacy being watched by some creepy man, right? No, I can only imagine it's been worse since the dawn of smartphones and social media. I just, that must be horrible. Well, as it turns out, there were some real creep wads in the Victorian era too. The boy Jones was a stalker of Queen Victoria who on multiple occasions snuck his way into Buckingham Palace, one time escaping with a pair of the Queen's underwear. What? Arrested multiple times, but still somehow found his way back to the palace. But what they should have done was swap the queen's underwear for a pair of mine after a shift in the garden center I used to work at. Oh yeah, nobody's coming for you after sniffing those bad boys. Oh! Number nine, graceful words. This was a time when ladies were supposed to be ladies, and that means manners are on the table and elbows are off. Dresses were worn to not show ankles, God forbid an ankle or wrist bust out. I think more importantly however, or rather unusual that is, is that women were expected to talk a certain way. Good evening Mr. Barrows, you must excuse my tardiness, there was a dreadful man screaming at me because my ankles were shown whilst mounting my carriage. Your what was showing love? Oh you hurdle, I, I can't believe it, excuse me, I must be someone else. I don't need to tell you guys how ridiculous that is. I say fly out the handle ladies, wear what you want, do what you want. Number 8, Shots. Not the kind I like. Well, I don't know about you guys, but nothing ruins the mood for me and my lady like being fired upon. Yikes. I'd like to stay the night kid, but the automatic gunfire coming from outside is starting to get to me. See? All gangster impressions aside, things must have been that way for poor Queen Victoria as she was shot in her carriage in 1840. A young man fired two shots at her carriage. More attacks would actually follow in the coming years. It's kind of hard to feel that certain kind of way after bullets go grazing past your pretty face. The worst thing that ever happened to my generation was making sure nobody was home when you were studying with your boyfriend. I was too busy playing Call of Duty, but at least I never got actually shot at. You know what I mean? That's just a good thing. Number seven, expectations. All right, this one goes out to all the married ladies in the audience. Hello, how are you? I'm doing great, thanks for asking. I'm curious as to why you got married and what your expectations were. Did you marry your high school sweetheart and live happily ever after? Maybe you had a shotgun wedding and after one night at the saloon. Maybe you just really wanted to find a nice man and settle down, start a family, be a mother. I think any of those options are great, so as long as you have options. In Victorian England, you were expected to do the latter. Women were expected to get married and have kids, and that's about it, really. My question is, why were angles and wrists an issue, but giving birth isn't? What I mean is it's kind of a compromising position to be in. All I'm asking is that the girls get treated fairly and given choices and be allowed to show some ankle. This makes any sense. You can look at her business down there, but you can't show an ankle. That doesn't make any sense. I'm a magician. Number six, double standard. Divorce sucks. It's no fun. The person you once loved and cherished is now the villain in your story. I love McDonald's and I don't ever want them to be the villain in my story. I love you guys. Gotta get those Happy Meals. Divorce is something that isn't new. Honestly, it was probably invented the second after marriage was. In Victorian times, men had the right to divorce their wife if they had committed adultery. Women could not. 
Well, if you refer to my last part, you know that men were doing more than a little window shopping when it came to women. When men left town for business, they would have hired the services of a woman who patrolled the streets at night. No, I'm not talking about Batwoman either. So men can divorce women if they dare to do what they did on a regular basis. Yeah, that's that's totally fair. Not yeah, that's good. Equal. Absolutely. Yeah. Number five, emo girl. All the forever alone people, raise your hand. Let me hear you roar XD. I like to joke around a lot and say I'm a lawyer, a firefighter, and the cutest guy on the whole wide internet. But if there's one thing I know, it's people. I like people. I love them. I spend a lot of time with them, and after hearing this, I've come to the conclusion that this is where the emo girls come from. I figured it all out. It's down to a science. I'm a scientist now. Do you ever get that feeling in your tummy on Valentine's Day because you know it's going to be another one alone? And you'll be forced to be on your own, and, and, and that means sad music and crying in your room. Same, it's, it's Drake's Marvin room for me. Well, single women in Victorian times had similar issues. Since women were expected to marry and have kids, single women who were also forever alone were pitied by society, which I argue is just way worse. Who, who, no one wants to be pitied. Ugh. Number four, gold diggers. She take my money when I'm in need. As she try to... Okay, anyway, back to the actual content. Well, not exactly. While today in a place like sunny California, you might see an older man with a woman who's half his age. Maybe he's driving a nice car, or she's got on the very best and latest from Louis Vuitton. Stylish, yeah. Most of us think some thoughts about what we might think is going on there. We can kind of be judgmental sometimes when we see things like that. However, looking through a lens of 2022 to Victorian times might make the women of Victorian times appear to be gold diggers, but in reality, it was because all of their financials were tied to their husbands, legally too. Which, if you can imagine, that system didn't work too well. What if your husband is broke? What if your husband is running amok with sultry lasses on the street corners? Like I said before, no divorce, but even if she could leave him easily, supporting herself afterwards was going to be an issue, especially financially. Number three, birth factory. Just pump them out. The faster the better. Quantity over quality, or just, just get them out. The use of birth control, as you can tell, was not a common practice. Anyone who's over the age of 25, ask your grandparents how many brothers and sisters they have. I'm willing to bet it's in the six to eight range. Let me know in the comments below, I'm curious. A trend that would continue for a few decades after. Education is important, and I'll get to that in my next part. Women were simply expected to act this way. Maybe it was the sign of the times since the Industrial Revolution was in full swing. Maybe the factories needed workers, I don't know. Which in case you didn't know, they used children as employees. Maybe not so nice. Unfortunately, that was when there was an issue, and there were many. They had no HR to go to, and that was the least of their worries, really. Number two, no school for you. No higher education for women. Banned from going to university. I don't think so, not very nice, no, no. Honestly, any society that doesn't want half of their population to go to school probably has a few things to work out. It's a boys club and they can only go to university so that they can learn to be smarter and be businessmen, so they can earn money and thus have the facilities to court a woman who really doesn't have a choice anyway. Women had jobs, not careers. And they were all the jobs that you can think of. The ones that were too feminine for men as women were too feeble to participate in a men's job, which is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. I'm happy to say that in 2022, we showed them wrong. Chetty loves everyone. Just remember that, I love everybody. You go, girls. Number one, strict rules. Okay, so after a night in the bed sheets with the gal that you love, or maybe the one that you found, there's a good chance that nine months later, a smaller version of you two could be walking around. A byproduct of intimacy, if you will. This was always something I wanted to rant about, but I always found it strange how strict parents and teachers from this time were with their kids. You gotta brush your hair, bed made, and whatever you do, don't ask for more gruel. Please sir, could I have some more? Whatever that Charles Dickens book was, I think it was Oliver Twist. They made us read those books as kids, and I don't know why, because they're kind of boring. From the extreme military code ethics happening at home to the long days in a factory at work, being a kid was tough, man. Earning the punk rock blues of today. I'm just a kid and my life is a nightmare. Number 10, it's just a cold sore. The Victorian era is cool. The art, the fashion, and technology of the time I think are always fun to take a look at, especially since steampunk has its roots in the Victorian era, and who doesn't like steampunk? Come on, there's just a lot of cool steampunk stuff. And honestly, we haven't seen a lot of that in a long time. We need, we need more, we need more. Something not so cool from that era, however, was what you could catch from another person should you decide to take up a bed with another person. 
Syphilis, yep, one heck of a disease. Funny enough, it was so common that it was making intimacy itself an unusual practice. People were scared, and honestly, maybe rightfully so. There's no cure, and if it progresses to its later stages back then, well, you'd go crazy. And then you'd end up being that guy that's always screaming in the streets. Every city has one. You know what I'm talking about. Number nine, the French letter. The issues of intimacy and its repercussions were becoming quite clear in the Victorian era. Something had to be done, as spending any amount of time in the brothels could have you shucking barnacles off your lower deck in the morning, if you know what I mean. Introducing the revolutionary new invention, prophylactics. For those that are college age, you might find it disturbing that these party favors weren't made of rubber or disposable. Yeah, hear me out. They were made of sheep's guts and they had to be soaked first so they would become flexible. Because when you put these bad boys on, they had to be fastened on. It's not very good, not very attractive. Once the deed had been signed off on, the device was then washed and then hung up to dry like your dirty laundry. Once it was dry, it was placed in a small box for the next time. Because seeing your wife's ankles might make you feel a certain kind of way and now you just have it ready to go. And Number eight, the products of our sins. Having fun when the lights can be turned off is great. Who doesn't enjoy a little toe curling, yeah? Except sometimes there's this crazy thing that can happen, where after nine months, another human spawns in. Insane, right? I know. Well, back in the Victorian era, this phenomenon was happening, but only for married couples. As you have to be married, of course, or else a child would be born out of wedlock, which to people at the time was just the worst. Oh, I never. These stigmas were not favorable for women, as some preferred to avoid that kind of press by abandoning or straight up just unaliving their children. Horrible, just, just horrible times. Just another one of those good old wholesome times in history where we were treating women with the utmost respect and decency. Very nice. We were actually not very nice. Number seven, diet. Bedroom misconduct was becoming a huge issue. Refer to number nine and 10. While women did get most of the blame because, well, you know, history, men did get some of the blame. The issue of intimacy for men could be described as barbaric primal sense. So how do we curb this? How do we stop men from acting on these caveman urges, ooga booga? Well, simple really. Men just have to stop eating certain foods, as it was thought at the time that food had a link to the misconduct, or rather, the overabundance of bedroom related issues, including mustard, pepper, rich gravy, beer, wine, cider, and tobacco. And if you weren't paying attention, that's basically the diet of every man in Victorian times. Not sure how a jar of finely prepped mustard would get you flustered, but okay, sure. The beer makes sense though, you know, have a few beers, and even the mop leaning over in the corner looks pretty lonely. And Boy, that mop has lovely hair. Number six, job market. Ladies of the evening, women of the night. Women who make beds go bump in the night. They were everywhere in Victorian London, a lot. It's partially related to some of the points I previously mentioned. Now, I'm not here to say it's necessarily a bad thing. Personally, I don't think it is. As they say, it's the oldest profession in the book, with an estimated 80,000 women working in the night by the late 1890s. You'd have to be crazy to miss that. I mean, they, they were literally everywhere. With numbers like that, there's something for everyone and in varying price ranges, as they can be found in brothels or townhomes set up by the wealthy men for their mistresses, pretty much anywhere trouble likes to spawn. Even some artists took advantage of this by living with the gorgeous girls of the evening, as going behind closed doors with one was debatable, but becoming friends? Now that's a social transgression. That, oh, becoming friend, oh, how dare you befriend the people of the night? Number five, Jolly Lad. When people think about certain magazines that depict lewd imagery, you probably only think of Playboy. The bunny imagery was good marketing, honestly, just, just smart. But what if I told you the Hefmeister wasn't the first to publish such a magazine or imagery? Back in the Victorian era, there was some saucy imagery being produced. The government had outlawed such indecency, but this only made the lewd picture industry move underground, where naturally it flourished, especially in major cities. And if you knew where to go and how to ask for one, you could purchase something from the hidden menu. Kind of like when you go to McDonald's. Yeah, there's a hidden menu there too. 
Google it and see for yourself. I'd repeat what my favorite one is, but I would be in trouble from the YouTube gods. And I've been treading on thin ice this whole video, so uh, number four, the first counterculture. The 1960s were a very important time for many different people. Black Americans were fighting for the rights, music went from holding hands to strawberry fields, if you know what I'm saying, and everything that your parents told you just, just kind of felt wrong. If you grew up then, you know what I mean. I know people like to make fun of hippies, but there was some good ideas there. Well, in 1890s England, they were sort of having the same thing happen. Obviously, not as strong as a push as it was in the 60s, but still. Basically, after all the oppression towards bedroom relations, people began to open up. Uh, not literally, just, just open up thinking-wise. That's really gross, don't repeat that. There's only one way we all got here. Unless you're a test tube baby, of course. In that case, thank you for watching CT133576-2. To some historians, this makes sense. When you push and push for things to happen or ban, eventually people will push back, especially if it's something like bedroom time. Everybody, everybody likes a little bit of bedroom time. Valentine's Day wasn't too long ago. Remember that? It was good. It was fun. It was good, good fun. Number three, Jack the Ripper. While the man's numbers don't compare to any of the other horrible people in history, he's unusual because of his brutality and the fact that he was never caught. Jack the Ripper was maybe the first modern serial on a liver. He haunted the streets of Victorian London and is responsible for claiming multiple women's lives, women of the evening to be exact, and they began to know the name Jack the Ripper. Now we'll probably just have to show you pictures of Victorian London or maybe some b-roll of a shadowy figure because there ain't no way we can show the crime scenes. There's probably a dozen different theories on who done it. Some say it was multiple men using his name as an alias, some say it was Prince Albert, there's even some who suggest that he was a she, and which explains why women were so easy to go off with Jack. That actually kind of makes sense to me at least, and why no one really would be looking for a woman back then. Kind of makes sense. Anyway, be careful out there ladies, just, just be careful. Number two, Queen Victoria. It seems old blightier self may have been a tad more promiscuous than you'd think a royal to be. Well, not with other men, but her husband. Who in her diary claims to be the love of her life, which honestly is kind of sweet and, and romantic. That's nice. One thing that I find interesting, however, is that while lewd images were outlawed, the queen may have commissioned a painting of herself that was quite risque for the time. To gift to her husband, of course. Hypocrisy much? I say lewd, but it was probably just in her loose-fitting clothes with maybe like an ankle showing or something. Still, unusual behavior for the queen. I'll remember that the next time, bro. I'll remember that. Number one, Prince Albert. If you've ever stepped foot into a tattoo parlor, then you might know where I'm going with this. Prince Albert, the husband of Queen Victoria, had some controversy circulating his name. One, because he shares a name with another Prince Albert, who was speculated to be Jack the Ripper, but also because of a very unique piercing. Go ahead and take a guess where that piercing is. Yeah, I didn't think so. As a man, if your anatomy could be described by an internet comedian using moderately funny euphemisms, then the piercing would go through your German army helmet. That makes sense, right? The horror, the absolute horror. It's rumored that he had one of these piercings. Did he? I, I'm not sure. But if it means anything to you, Nicholas II had a tattoo, so it's not completely out of the realm of possibility. Number 10, train engine cleaner. Ever wanted to get inside a small hole in the engine of a train and shovel out the coal that was left in there? Ever wanted to go underneath a train where you can't fully stand up in the middle of the night and rake out a dusty ash pan, getting all kinds of ash and stuff in your mouth? Perfect! You can go join up with the railroad as a train engine cleaner. These guys would spend their days shoveling five to six tons of coal into the furnace of the steam trains, and then spend their nights climbing into said furnace, cleaning it out, and then going out in the middle of the freezing cold, wet night into a trench covered in water and oil and dust, and get right up under that sucker and pull out all the ashes and dust and crap that came out of the engine while it had been running all day. Number nine, linker boy or linker men. Before the introduction of gas lights on the streets of London, the only gas lighting came in the form of small children who made you believe that you wouldn't be able to walk the streets without them tagging along with a torch to help guide your way. Then they'd expect a tip from you, oh, rascals. They weren't so bad. They were generally pretty helpful in getting you from point A to point B while being able to see one foot in front of the other. And their charge was usually just one farthing, or the equivalent of a quarter. The linker boy, like a lot of the jobs on this list, was actually featured in a lot of art and literature from the time, and there were even some rather infamous ones, like Lawrence Casey, who was the personal linker boy for the courtesan Betty Careless. Oi! 
Where are you going, mate? You forgot to like and subscribe to the channel. Oh, and while I've got your attention, why not take a little peek over at our Facebook, where you'll find behind the scenes content. Get on with it. All right, all right, bloody hell, bloody hell. Number eight, knock her up. No, not like that. God, look. I despise my alarm clock. It wakes me out of my deeply deserved beauty sleep at 6 a.m. every weekday morning. Now take the alarm clock and assign that job to a real person. That person is a knocker up, a person employed to wake up workers at mills and factories on early shifts, going from house to house using a long pole to knock on bedroom windows. In other words, a person employed to become the epitome of all my hatred in this world. If you had this job, well, you're not alive anymore, but I hate you. The people at the time were somewhat friendlier than they are now, and I'm sure the knocker-upper wasn't a horrible person, but I'm sure there had to be some grumpy gills who would put their hand on your chest for doing this to them. Number seven, a phrenologist. I think if this YouTube thing doesn't work out for me, I'm gonna go and make up a science. It worked for phrenologists. They claimed that a person's personality, character traits, and abilities could all be figured out by bumps and indents on a person's skull. Characteristics like secretiveness, amativeness, conjugality, and combativeness were apparently controlled by areas of the brain that they called organs of the brain. The idea was dismissed by the church, but it nonetheless gained traction through Europe and was really popular in the States. The idea that you could modify these organs through self-control and practice sounded really good to self-help gurus at the time, if only it was real. Number six, a dog whipper. Looking for someone who absolutely despises dogs and doesn't mind being despised by the rest of us otherwise known as a dog whipper. Back in the day, huntsmen would often hunt foxes and nail their tails to church doors, which would attract dogs of the streets. You'd also have churchgoers who would bring their dogs with them to church. These dogs were not allowed in though, so they'd all have to wait outside. You know how dogs are though. They didn't just sit there waiting patiently. I'm sure some good boys and girls did, but more often than not, they'd be playing and sometimes fighting, disrupting the church services. Enter the dog whipper, who was armed with tongs to grab a dog and remove it from the church grounds, and a whip that would be used on the loudest of the poor pooches. Number five, a rat catcher. I know this will make a few of you out there squirm in your seats. Rats in Victorian England were a massive problem. They were everywhere every nook and cranny of your house, from the basement to the pipes. There was even an account of them spilling over from royal parks. So of course, where there is a problem, there is a job. Rat catchers were pretty famous throughout the Victorian era and were highly praised in society, but the job wasn't too glamorous. You'd be going into the dark, dirty places where rats would make their homes and catching and often killing thousands of rats a year. Often rat catchers would use other animals like dogs and ferrets to help them hunt down the rats too. I don't know though, it's gonna be me. Number four, an upright worker. Upright workers, otherwise known as chimney sweeps, actually started off being children as young as the age of four. The smaller size of the little kiddos was perfect for fitting inside and climbing up and down chimneys. The little suckers would rub their elbows and knees up against the brick of the chimney so much that they would be scraped raw before callousing. Isn't that lovely? No, no it's not. It's horrible. Some children were deliberately underfed to keep them small enough to do the job. Some of them would get permanent lung damage from the dust and smut and smoke from the chimney. Some kids even got stuck in the chimneys. Thank the Lord they eventually passed a law that would make it illegal for anyone under the age of 21 to be a chimney sweep. But even then, tis not a profession many would like to have. Number three, matchstick makers. The idea of a lighter wasn't really a big thing in the Victorian era. They definitely existed, as the first one was invented in 1823, but it was not exactly a portable thing. So matches were your match. The first match was invented in 1805, but it sucked. The first friction activated match came about in 1826, and they were made with white phosphorus, which is extremely toxic. But they didn't have machines to make these matches. No, it was actually mainly done by teenage girls and in the worst of conditions too. Forget protective gear. Oh, you wanna take your lunch break away from the highly toxic white phosphorus? Oh, no, no, no. That's right, these girls would have to eat their lunch at their workstations, meaning they would end up ingesting the white phosphorus. Mmm, yes, my favorite seasoning. Number two, 
Resurrectionists. Back in the day, medical schools who wished to study the human body only really had access to the bodies of criminals who had hit the end of the line. There actually weren't too many of these bodies around, which led to a good price for bodies that were in reasonably good condition other than being deceased. This wasn't exactly the greatest idea as now you've created an opportunity for people with no morals or empathy to go and dig up fresh graves, becoming resurrectionists. A cool name for an absolutely god awful profession, if you could call it that. The problem was bad enough that people would actually guard the graves of their recently deceased loved ones. No one should have to do that. Number 1. Night Soil Man all right, if you need me, I'll be depositing my night soil over in the toilet. Poop. Night soil is poop. And the night soilman? Well, you see, before we had real sewer systems, the night soil you deposited at home would go into a lovely hole in the ground. As you can imagine, these would tend to fill up over time, and that's when you have your night soilman come in. Yes. His job was to clear out the poop deposits from houses and cart it away in the middle of the night so nobody in polite society would have to see it. But they were always in business, so that makes the job a little less crappy. Kick it off the list at number 10, Smokey Behind. When somebody tells you that you're just blowing smoke, it means that you're lying, okay? You've now been given exaggerated information of sorts. Well, back in the 18th century, they literally had to blow tobacco smoke at your Behind. Yeah, weirdest work break ever, I'd say. So why did we perform magician enemas back in the day? What was the deal here? Well, tobacco smoke enemas were used to treat quite a few symptoms, or they thought so, including a common cold. These enemas came in these fancy kits with a fancy rubber tube. It was all fancy because it was an honest medical practice at the time. It was done by legit medical practitioners. This is the funniest part. The idea was that the tobacco smoke could warm up a soon to be deceased body. The nicotine would stimulate your adrenal glands, jolting you back into good health. The best health, might we say. And the way they would do it in the mid 1800s was by just blowing smoke and just waiting, seeing what happened. We're figuratively and literally blowing smoke. That's the origin of that saying. Fun fact there. Imagine doing that today. Like, hey, I think I dislocated my shoulder. What do I do? He's like, hey, one sec. Number nine, alarm clocks. While the medical world was one threat in Victorian times, apparently so was the technological side. Who knew? We obviously didn't have reliable alarm clocks back in the 1800s, obviously, but we did have jobs. So in order to get up on time, lamp lighters or knockers would come by and tip you off. Yeah, they would just yell in your window and just alarm. That's how you'd wake up. A man would yell into your window and smack you with a stick. Legend has it a young man named Sam Wardell, he got a little creative with his wake up calls. He needed more than a lamp lighter at 5 a.m. So he would Tony Stark this alarm clock gadget. He would use wires, a bunch of stones, all that unsafe stuff. Then at a certain time, stones would fall to the ground, of course, waking him up and presumably everyone else in the building. That would be alarming. Well, Christmas Eve, 1885, tragedy unfolded. A few friends have come over for a holiday visit, so Sam had to move some furniture around, rightfully so, to make room for, you know, windmills and break dancing, whatever they did in Victorian Christmas times. The next morning, he forgot to put things back in the small apartment, and the obvious happened. The rocks then fell on him while he was asleep. Yeah, that probably doesn't feel too good. I thought iPhone alarms were jarring. I take back everything I've ever said. Number eight, relaxative. Okay, so right off the bat, the Victorian era was a little messy. I'm sure you've gathered this by now here on Bumblebee. But these messy new illnesses were putting lots of pressure on medical practitioners, so they were desperate for these new treatments. We laugh at Victorian medical treatments, but they tried, okay? They at least tried. They also achieved many medical breakthroughs as well. But when it comes to handling chicken pox in the Victorian era, well, that wasn't one of them. That was not our finest hour. Chicken pox in the Victorian era was being treated by using laxatives. Yeah, let that sink in for a moment. I have chicken pox, what should I do? Well, try some laxatives. Yeah, folks would slam some castor oil and then, ready for this? They would get even more sick. Who would have thought? You thought you were uncomfortable before, castor oil, yeah, chug that, and then now you're even weaker, now you're dead. Number seven, backed up. Let's say it's the Victorian era and let's say you're constipated, right? It happens, you know? Well, bad ideas will most likely follow, if you didn't already guess that. According to Merck's 1899 medical manual, small amounts of strychnine were prescribed to those who were constipated. Yeah, the strychnose nux vomica was thought to better the gastric functions. Even a small amount of this stuff would attack your respiratory system. You'd contract, you convulse, it's horrible. It'd be a painful way to go out. It's much, much worse than being constipated. Any day. I would much rather be constipated than 
any type of strychnine. Are you kidding me? Number six, leeches. I grew up with hearing problems. I've been around the block with ear aches, ear infections. I had ear tubes numerous times, all that jazz. So I feel really bad for the folks in this next one, okay? I hear you, pun intended. In the Victorian era, medical practitioners would say to use leeches for your ear infections. That's the number one trick they don't want you to know. There it is. Once they're attached to you, the idea was that they can numb pain while at the same time providing proteins and peptides to its host. So on paper, again, the idea made sense. But the science didn't quite follow, did it? It wasn't entirely hopeless though. Recently in 2004, the FDA reintroduced leeches to the medical world, yeah, because their bite can break up blood clots and induce blood flow. So it's not entirely hopeless. We talked about leech collectors on this channel before, so of course we have to talk about more of the science that they were hoping to achieve with it, right? Also, I worked at a retirement home when I was 16. I thought that job sucked. Imagine being a leech collector? No way. Number five, cat attacks. If I had to pick, I would of course say I'm 100% a dog person. I got, I'm sorry, I grew up with two cats, I'm allergic. I grew up with two dogs, not allergic. Dog guy all the way, sorry. Cats are cool, but this next story just totally freaked me out. Back in 1870, this rich woman had put her time, energy, and resources into cat breeding. How lovely is that? She had tons of cats, she loved all of them, and they loved her. Again, I'm allergic, so this, I'm already sneezing just reading about this story. It was the 1800s, okay? A lot of candles, everything was obviously extremely flammable, and disaster hit often in Victorian times. And in 1870, a fire broke out at this young woman's home. The cats were trapped inside the house. Now, they made it outside, don't freak out or anything, they all made it out, but by the time the two maids had kicked the door open to rescue said cats, they had gone full primal. They were afraid, they were freaking out. They were just scratching their way out through anyone and everything. The fire in the house had obviously scared them, so when the doors were open, these two maids were both sadly attacked by all of these cats. What a horrible thank you for saving all of their lives. I pulled my cat's tail when I was younger. I learned real quick uh, never to do that ever again. Number four, hiccups. Today we have many cures for hiccups, yeah. You gotta get scared or hold your breath or drink water like while you're doing a handstand. I don't know, everyone's got weird ideas, whatever. But nothing was as dangerous as the Victorian era hiccup cure, yeah. Ready for this one, don't try it. This one's scarier than a jump scare, that's for sure. In 1899, again, in the good old Merck Medical Manual, it recommended using chloroform to cure your hiccups. Uh? Yeah, just completely damage your entire nervous system and poison your kidneys, for sure. To get rid of hiccups, that's way better. This 19th century anesthetic was not a solution. Never try this. Continue scaring your family and friends. That's definitely the way we handle hiccups now. Number three, tapeworms. Back in the Victorian times, they really figured out the trick to weight loss. Yeah, was it watching what you eat, maybe counting your steps, maybe getting a gym membership, something like that? Nope, nope, and no way. No, it was way easier than all those things combined. Can you believe that? And you didn't even have to pull back on how much you were consuming. Doesn't this sound fascinating? What is this? Well, all you needed was a handy tapeworm. Yep, I don't have one. I don't know why I pointed. That'd be gross if I had one. Yeah, tapeworm. You know those things that can kill you today if you get one? See, the plan was if you eat a tapeworm egg, okay, it will later hatch in your stomach and at that point you could just eat anything you wanted. Because every time you ate, the tapeworm would also eat. So you could get your snack on while still rocking those Victorian skinny jeans, right? Tapeworm cyst pills or go for a jog. Your call. Number two, Victoria's reign. Queen Victoria's reign started in 1837 and it lasted until the queen's death later on in 1901. At just age 18, Alexandrina Victoria had to rise up to the throne. She was born, of course, on May 24th, 1819. Queen Victoria was fifth in line when she was born, so right off the bat, it was actually highly unlikely that she would ever get the crown. Then one by one, out of nowhere, all of her family members began passing away suddenly. In four years, three of Victoria's cousins passed away, and then her father and grandfather both died a week apart from each other. So by the time 1830 rolled around, Victoria was only 11 years old, and already she was next in line for the throne. That's how fast it happens. So as if that wasn't already stressful enough, Victoria was brought up under the Kensington system, which if you haven't heard of before, it's, it's pretty awful. Victoria's mother, Duchess Victoria of Kent, she created this Kensington system to control her daughter. She literally isolated the child from mates or family members, anything fun or social, you name it. Her mother did this to keep her Pure, of course, to keep her the most pure lady. This system sounds awful. Her mother would monitor her every action, including who she can see or speak to. Victoria only had two playmates growing up. That's it. I'm like, hey, me too. 
She had her half-sister, Princess Fedora of Lennington, and the Duchess attendant, Sir John Conroy, his daughter, Victoire. I mean, only three friends growing up, that's cruel. She shared a room with her mother until she was finally queen. Yeah, she couldn't walk down the hallway alone at any point. She had to always walk with her mother by her side, even to the washroom, that's crazy. Victoria has reflected on her childhood since, and yeah, she hates John Conroy for manipulating her mother, and she actually refers to him as Demon Incarnate, so. That's good, it's a nice nickname. Incarnate, incarnate. He's a demon, he's the worst. Let's just call him that. And finally, number one, royal enemies. Being the queen and all, a security team is of course needed at all times. And during her reign, there were multiple attempts to harm the young Queen Victoria. The first attack was back in 1840. It was a young guy named Edward Oxford and he attacked the queen's carriage. He just ran at it like a crazy guy. Obviously, and thankfully, nothing happened. But when Edward was later accused of high treason, he was actually found not guilty due to insanity. Then a couple years later, in 1842, it happened again, but this time it was two men attacking the carriage. And then in 1849, her carriage was attacked by William Hamilton. In 1850, as the carriage was passing the gates of Buckingham Palace, Robert Pate, a retired soldier, ran up and hit the carriage with his cane. He was going nuts as well. Everyone wants this carriage. This is like the ultimate, no one's getting through this carriage, apparently. Victoria was okay, luckily, but of course she was shook after all these events. Then again in 1842, 1849, 1872, attempt after attempt, it was horrifying. But then things got a little worse with a man named Boy Jones. Yeah, this guy stalked the queen from 1838 until 1841. This guy somehow managed to break into Buckingham Palace more than once. He knew a way in just to Buckingham Palace, which should never be a thing in the first place. And the weird part is here, Boy Jones, once he was inside the palace, he would hide under the queen's sofa. And he would also just sit on her throne for hours, just hanging out. Yeah, he would pretend he's Cersei Lannister and just sit on the throne for a minute or two. Think about life. Eventually, thankfully, he got caught, but Imagine coming home and Boy Jones is sitting on your couch. You're like, what are you doing? Take that shirt off, get out of here. Number 10, mudlarks. Victorian London, around the 1840s, it was a bit of a mess. Yeah, a lot of sore throats, that's for sure. Everybody was sick all the time and the jobs that were available certainly did not help the cause. The jobs that were available had you catching rats and crawling into sewers. One of the worst jobs to have was that of a mudlark. As their name hints towards, a mudlark involved getting in deep in the muck that builds up alongside the Thames River. This one was reserved for younger folks, obviously, because it was like working in quicksand. If you were older, you would just get trapped. It was pretty sad. It was also exhausting, not to mention the chances of being washed away by the river were pretty high. All for the slim chance of finding a pocket watch, driftwood, rags, anything really worth your troubles. Number nine, chimney sweep. I remember when I was younger, I had to sweep the chimney in the house every now and then, whatever, and I personally, I loved it, you know? I thought I was the father of the house for a bit, getting in the chimney, getting all dirty and stuff, doing this, my hands on my, on my waist, I don't know, it's, that's, that's what a man was when I was younger. That little broom too, I love that little broom. I remember when I would do this, my grandmother, who is very English, she would be shook. She would watch the entire time. She would be taken back into time because this was a terrible job to have in Victorian London. I was, yeah, it was not the same at all. Chimney sweeps were famously young. I can't say anything else there in regards, but yeah, they were, we lads, to say the least. History is horrible. 1840 was a good year, all things considered, because a law was passed that then made it illegal for anyone under the age of 21 to climb in and then clean a chimney. Thank, thank God, I'm glad that stopped. I was 18 cleaning my chimney. I had no idea I could have used this great law. Been like, actually, mother, a lot of claws. Number eight, funeral mute. Funerals suck, man. I was a pallbearer like three times before the age of 21. My one arm is just strong as fuck now, that's it. I can lift anything just with one arm. I thought being a pallbearer had a lot of pressure, right? Victorian London saw many, many funeral mutes. Oliver Twist, one of those lousy jobs in that tale was that of a funeral mute. Funeral mutes were required to dress in all black with a sash while carrying a long cloth covered stick and your job would essentially be to stand and mourn silently at the door of the recently deceased home. Yeah, guy dies of a plague and you're like standing there like holding your breath like great, this is the worst job ever. You would then lead the coffin to the graveyard. So a lot of responsibility. Yeah, don't trip or breathe. Number seven, toilet troubles. Now the Victorian era was unsanitary to say the least, but it was also dangerous in ways that you wouldn't expect, right? Go to the bathroom and may not come out. 
toilet. One of the greatest Victorian inventions was that of the bathroom, but it took a few tries to figure out the whole, you know, methane gas problem. We gotta really deal with that one first and foremost. Spontaneous combustion of the bathroom was weirdly common. This would, uh, this is every time you take a shit, you were worried that you might just Woo! It was horrible. That's so scary. Flammable gases like methane and hydrogen sulfide, they would build up over time with human waste. Human, a, a, a lot of human waste. Built up in the sewers and then eventually would back up into your homes. Next thing you know, you're lighting a candle and your bathroom's gone. Just like that. Now we have poo-pourri. You know what that is? You ever see a little spray after you go, you just... You hide what you've done with one little spray at your friend's house. It's fascinating how far we've come. Number six, stairs. Yeah, believe it or not, stairs were a common danger in Victorian times. I'm somebody personally who falls up and down stairs a lot. I'm 6'2", I'm lanky as shit. I have like a Gumby body. I walk around like Woody. I'm always falling up and down stuff. It's horrible, especially in Canada. It's so slippery. I'm always, always slipping all the time. In Victorian times, I would have been doomed. Houses were thrown up comedically fast. There wasn't a Mike Holmes on Holmes to come in and check it out. There wasn't a building inspector that made things, you know, safe. Servant staircases, they were tiny. They were out of sight. They were built into these narrow walls, often missing steps that they had to and cut corners just to, you know, be narrow and out of the way. That plus a tray of hot soup and a lot of clothing, yeah, it was next to impossible to move around without something happening. A lot of fatalities and staircases. Even today, around 12,000 people die each year falling downstairs. Hold on to that railing. I'm here to remind you to hold on to that railing. It's crazy. There's actually no stairs there. I just made that whole thing up. Hit that like button for magic. Number five. Burke and Hare. Medical schools were offering a handsome fee for deceased bodies to study. This was, this is an odd time. So an unhealthy amount of Victorians came up with this new solution. They thought they were brilliant. Yeah, they would rob graves. They would just go and rob the freshest graves they could find. They would wait in the bushes until the funeral's over and then they would go and Disgusting. It got so out of hand that family members were actually guarding the graves of recently deceased overnight. That's how bad it got. That's disgusting. But nobody goes down in history like William Burke and William Hare. They were an unlikely duo, to say the least. They wouldn't wait until the body was done living. You know what I mean? They would actually kill people and rush the process, all for a pretty penny. 16 victims in total between 1827 and 1828. It took 16 victims for people to start catching on to this weird plan. The pair would lose were victims into their house, fill them with alcohol, and then they would suffocate them. They had a sick system and they would suffocate them because the body needed to be in the best condition possible in order to receive a payout from the Edinburgh University Medical School. So they would, you know, try and keep it as clean as possible, which is horrible to say, but it makes sense. The Anatomy Act in 1832 put an end to this horrific plan. Number four, bird hats. Look, I don't have much to say about this next one here because, well, all right, yeah. I love a good hat. I've worn a few hats here throughout my time on Bumblebee, some baseball caps, some beanies here and there, sure. I've never worn a dead bird on my hat though, and I don't think that I will. That's for certain, I might just leave that out. Taxidermy was a hot topic back in Victorian London. Folks would rock the dead beaver bowler hat, any animal they would just prop up there, and it was considered fashion at the time, believe it or not. It was a dangerous trend though long-term. Conservationalists were saying that 67,000 species of birds were all at risk of extinction due to this crazy dead bird hat craze. Can you imagine just a stuffed seagull on my hat? I'm like, all right, number five, here we go. It's crazy. Also, that's like a lot of weight, you know what I mean? A lot of weight on your head, just kind of, oh sorry, there's just a dead pigeon on my head, so my neck's kind of sore. What if the wings opened up and you kind of just like got some air? Maybe that's why they did it. Number three, holiday cards. Today, these Hallmark holiday cards, they go way too hard. And they also have a card for everyone and everything, you name it. Birthdays, weddings, stepdad's name day, you're like, what? That's so specific. Like they have everything covered, but back in the 1800s, these holiday cards, they were brand new. Nobody knew what to write or say, so they would just end up sending these artistic sentimental scenes. It would be like a frog in a top hat riding a bike. No caption, just that. You'd be like, hey, Merry Christmas, I guess. It'd be like a carrot with a face. It'd be a haunting image, really, to receive from a loved one on Christmas, but it's the thought that counts, I guess. This holiday season, just give your parents a card with this on it and then see what they do. Don't even write anything. Just stare at them in the corner, all Victorian-like, and be like, 
mother, father, merry fortnight Christmas. I don't know what they would say. Number two, lots of arsenic. We of course have to mention a big problem in the 1800s. Arsenic, everywhere, all at once, okay? Skin lotion, tons of cosmetics, it was a nightmare. Even if you didn't use any facial cream or anything, it was everywhere else. It was in wallpaper, it was in dresses, it was in toys, medicine. My gosh, it really was horrible, it's a nightmare. And it's because arsenic was cheap at the time. It was during the Industrial Revolution. It was being unearthed more and more, and finally, come 1851, the Arsenic Act was passed, which fixed a lot of issues. Yeah, we regulated that one not soon enough, but we definitely got that one fast. And finally, number one, Jack the Ripper. Unidentified to this day, we've gotta end on a horrific note. Everybody's just finding out now about Jeffrey Dahmer, it seems, he's a hot topic on Netflix. But what about Jack the Ripper? How did he get away with it this entire time? Why aren't we going to see a Netflix doc on him? Ever. Jack the Ripper was active in the East London neighborhoods, primarily targeting sex workers in the area. Now, at the time, the murders of five women from August to November of 1888 were believed to have been connected somehow to Jack the Ripper, although some sources claim that he was active even until 1891. Again, we're never gonna know at this point. Many believe Jack the Ripper had some anatomical knowledge due to the way that he left his victims. I can't really say anything else because it's disgusting, but yeah, he knew some things, disgustingly. And while there were some suspects, including a member of the British royal family, believe it or not, Jack the Ripper was still never identified. Getting us started at number 10 is top hats. A top hat is an iconic image. You can see them in old black and white movies or on logos such as Mr. Peanut. But why were top hats created and why were they so trendy? Well, there's multiple reasons actually. Men and women were already wearing hats and bonnets to protect their heads from rain wind, and the soot from local smokestacks. As a result, hats were already quite a trendy wear. However, the true reason for its popularity is what it represented. The top hat quickly became symbolic of status, power, and masculinity. From 1850 to 1900, men wore top hats for business, pleasure, and formal occasions. Certain colors were even associated with certain times of day. For example, a black top hat was for day or night, making its wear feel taller, more handsome, even suave. Some were even reported to be a height of 12 to 14 inches tall. Top hats, amongst other hats of this era, also required ridiculous upkeep, such as being brushed, boiled regularly, powdered, etc. They also tend to contain mercury poison. As time progressed, we found other ways to overcompensate as well as accessorize our heads, so it's easier to see why the top hat never made a comeback. Number nine in the countdown is women and their flirty fans. When you see a gentleman caller across the room, you may want to send him a hint that you're picking up the vibe that his top hat is putting out. What better way than sublimial messaging with an item you're already carrying? In Victorian times, women carried fans due to fainting spells, which were really just the result of their excessively tight and heavy garments, something we'll cover later in the video. In 1827, a fan maker from Paris, Double Roy, published a leaflet explaining the language behind the uses of a fan. Some examples were twirling the fan in the right hand meant that I love another. Meanwhile, drawing the fan across the cheek told someone special that I love you. A fan half opened and pressed to the lips gave permission for a kiss. However, it is rumored that the less romantic truth is that the fan etiquette, such as Duval Roy's leaflet, was invented in order to boost the sales of fans in the 19th century after they had fallen out of fashion following the French Revolution. Irregardless of rumors, it appears in olden times some people were using fans to get hot rather than cool down. Speaking of keeping it cool, next in our countdown at number 8 is bottomless underwear. While showing a bit of ankle may have made you a harlot, in the Victorian era every woman was walking around with crotchless undergarments. But these strange underoos were invented with a justified purpose. Due to the amount of fabric layers, steel crinolines, and tight bodices and dresses, women of the era didn't really have time to spend an hour undressing before nature calls. By creating undergarments that had holes aligned with the wearer's groin, a woman's only mission would be to hoist up as many layers as she could before popping a squat. Don't be fooled however, that wasn't exactly easy. Either. Some of you may wonder what happened if Aunt Flo paid a visit while a woman was wearing an open bottom undergarment. Well, in Victorian times, menstruation hygiene was perceived very different and women quite literally let it flow. If you want to learn more, search that one up on your own. As fashion evolved and women wore fewer and lighter clothes in the early 20th century, pulling down undergarments from underneath bustles and cages was no longer a nightmare, so the crotchless undergarment was soon abandoned once more. But now it does make sense why everyone loved the high kicking can-can dancers in 19th century Paris. Morning garb, and I don't mean pajamas, is number seven in 
Monarch Countdown. Known as the Monarch of Mourning, Queen Victoria influenced how grieving women dressed and behaved in Europe and the United States after the passing of her husband in 1861. She famously mourned him for 40 years until her own demise and started what's now known as the Victorian mourning etiquette. Victorian mourning etiquette came with elaborate rituals to commemorate their dead. It became normal to have incredibly elaborate and lavish funerals, curtail social behavior, and even erect statues and ornate monuments as tombstones. Mourning clothes were part of this and they were introduced for both sexes. Set to show a family's outward display of their inner feelings after the passing of a loved one, the rules for who wore what and for how long were complicated and often outlined in popular journals or household manuals. Call that a mourner's magazine. Jokes aside, men definitely had it a lot easier. They simply wore their usual dark suits along with black gloves, hat bands, cravats, or ties. For women, especially should she be a widow, there were different levels of mourning and garb to wear as you progressed out of deep mourning and into lighter mourning and so forth. Deep mourning uh, was of course black, but also made specifically was a crepe styling, a scratchy silk with a puffed crimped appearance associated with mourning as it doesn't pair with any other clothing. Right. The mourner would eventually stop donning the crepe and then stop donning black. This was called slightening the mourning before cloth colors eventually moved on to gray, mauve, then white until the mourning period was considered complete. Number six in our countdown is the human hair wearers. Fun because it rhymes but creepy for a whole slew of reasons. So what do I mean by human hair wearers? Well it was a tradition in Victorian era to don jewelry that had segments of human hair embossed, woven, or sealed into it. But for many Victorian people, the amount of hair involved in remembering loved ones went far beyond a little lock in a necklace. In stores and women's magazines, you could find patterns for wreaths made of hair and wire, often floral designs. Bracelets, brooches, earrings, and necklaces were also all very common. In its prime, human hair, jewelry, and decor was considered incredibly fashionable. It's even said that swapping locks of hair was a love token between women loving women or friends the way that girls today might wear friendship bracelets with each other. I guess if you need a trim and you were already late on a birthday gift, you could really just kill two birds with one stone. Number 5 in the countdown is all about buggy dresses. The wealthy Victorians were very into the grandeur, looking to feed a fascination with culture especially. Beetle wing embroidery was at a peak of fame in the 18th century India and was quickly appropriated by English visitors while military occupied the country from 1858 to 1940. A litra, which is the hard casing over a beetle's wing, first appeared on dresses and experienced their first burst of popularity in England by the 1820s, though English women in India had likely been donning it since at least the 1780s. Material used was often white or other pale colors to help augment the reflective green tones of the beetle wing. This visual was made possible when a litra was paired with zardozi, a gold embroidery style often done on colored cottons or silks. Victorians at least didn't appropriate everything about the art form. They made patterns and styles of their own for the dresses. Elytra was sewn onto the gowns in an imitation of live beetle patterns, a reflection of Victorian interest in naturalism and zoology. Not sure why anyone wants to look like they have live bugs crawling on them, but. Okay. Number four is the casual ball gown. One of the most notable shifts in Victorian time was that fashion began to be differentiated by gender rather than class. This reflected the changing rules of women in society. And let me say, every part of Victorian women's fashion seems tortuous. You start your day layering on long crotchless underwear and tunics before strapping a metal cage to your waist. You then wear an average of six skirts over that, alongside bodices and corsets that would forever change the placement of your organs and potentially even suffocate you to death. The reported average weight of a Victorian dress when fully on could be anywhere between 14 and 22 pounds. But the risk doesn't end there. In fact, it was everywhere. It was estimated that between the 1850s and 1860s, 3,000 women in England died from their crinolines catching fire, as airy fabrics and hoop supported skirts also allowed for plenty of air to circulate beneath a dress, which could also make a small flame grow out of control in seconds. In 1860, the New York Times reported that 40,000 women worldwide perished from dress related fires. Another common occurrence was to see them pulled into machinery after walking too close and having some of the skirts catch in exposed parts. Yikes. It's no wonder that the large ball gown crinolines phased out in the late 1800s, but then bustles came in and they were worse in different ways. While more practical as it was slim on the sides and the front, it required women to sacrifice movement and comfort in order to achieve a fashionable shape like the 
the corset did. They began to alter women's spines, ribs, and organs over time as they required women to twist their bodies completely in order to be able to sit down. Overall, while movies and TV may make these beautiful gowns seem whimsical and ethereal, they truly were just death traps. Number three in the countdown is bird-brained. I enjoy my puns, but there's a reason for that one. This trend was started by the notorious Marie Antoinette, a rebel in the French courts for her outlandish fashion and accessories. Amongst her pile of powdered curls, Marie was often seen with feathered caps and bonnets. While this look became an envy for women across America and Europe, the trend did struggle to take off initially as much of the aristocracy was perturbed by it. However, a trend is a trend, and eventually the English society was persuaded. They donned mainly ostrich, pheasant, or peacock feathers at first. Eventually entire songbirds were stuffed after their death and adorned these hats. By the late 1800s, the plume trade had decimated several species of birds, including flamingos, birds of paradise, and rosy spoonbirds. Topping the endangered list were the snowy and great egrets, as at one point their pure white feathers were worth more than gold. Promoters of the feather trade knew what they were doing and also knew that the public didn't understand the carnage that their fashion was sieging on these animals. They held that wearing feathers and whole birds brought city dwellers closer to nature, that it improved people's awareness and knowledge of bird species. Thankfully, it's due to the inevitable public awareness and then disapproval that bird hat sales diminished and went out of trend altogether. Number two slot in the countdown is Paris Green. It seemed Parisian aristocracy had a chokehold on the globe with their trends. It's believed Empress Eugenie was to have worn a dress so stunning at the Paris Opera one evening in 1864 that it was featured in newspapers globally the next day. It was a deep yet vibrant green, one rumored to almost glow in darkness. The green of Paris quickly became the hue of the social elite. So how was Paris green made and why was it so dangerous? The color was discovered when chemists combined copper and arsenic poison. The result was a dye brighter than all the other greens available on the market. Copper wasn't what gave this color its iconic nickname, however. Arsenic is a highly hazardous substance that causes skin sores, vomiting, diarrhea, and in some circumstances, cancers or death, as we know now. But they didn't. When factory workers' arms and hands began to wilt away from sores and decay that could only be connected to the dye, French and German governments enacted legislation prohibiting the production of arsenic-based pigment. It's the right thing to do. Meanwhile, the British government mainly ignored them. Even when Matilda Schreuer famously died of arsenic poisoning with the whites of her eyes stained green from her working in factories. This was deemed accidental poisoning by the government at the time. Paris green remained popular in England until ironically it just went out of trend. It's a little bit of an abrupt ending honestly. No justice for those exposed in workplaces or compensation for suffering. But nothing takes the cake quite like the Victorian trend of looking dead, which is number one in our countdown. You'd figure people look dead enough as is inhaling arsenic and mercury from their clothes and shoes and hats constantly, let alone their home decor. But looking dead was the fashion of the day. This look was specifically modeled after how tuberculosis affected you. Pale skin, watery eyes, red lips. While this disease was decimating the lower status, higher status women recreated it with makeup and arsenic consumption. You heard me right. In order to get pale skin, women consumed arsenic. In order to not die from arsenic, the consumer had to follow a careful process, eating small doses to build up a tolerance. Now, arsenic is addictive, so if they at any point stopped the consumption, they would experience withdrawals such as vomiting, stomach pains, convulsions, hair loss, nervous system failure, kidney failure, delusions, the list goes on. Some women were stuck taking it for the rest of their lives. For the desired watery eye look, women would put citrus or even perfume in their eyes. Some went farther, using belladonna flower, also known as deadly nightshade, for longer lasting tears. However being poisonous, little wonder why blindness was a widely reported as a symptom of belladonna drops. No wonder it did such a good job. Red lip paint included? You guessed it, more poison. In this case, usually lead. All of these poisonous products would contribute to illnesses and facial decay. Death was of course a long term side effect of the usage once poisoning reached its crescendo. Suffice to say, while you may really want to fit in, some trends are not worth getting on board for, especially if they'll slowly melt your face off. Number 10, the cholera belt. 
This is just so silly to me. While the Victorian era seems like a long, long time ago, it's really only like three to four people ago. So yeah, your, your grandparents or maybe even your great grandparents could have experienced a life like this. As we all know, disease was rampant back then and thank God we're a little less gross now, am I right? Well, cholera was quite the tummy bug going around back then, causing upset stomach, indigestion, and the Oregon Trail's favorite, diarrhea. Ooh, no thanks. So the people of Victorian times came up with something that, well, wasn't only functional, but fashionable too. Very nice. The cholera belt was a piece of red fabric that was to be wrapped around the belly to keep you warm. That's because people thought having a cold belly caused cholera. Because yeah, that's, that's, that devil gives you cholera. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. That's what does it. It's not. It's a, it's a sickness. It's a virus. Number nine, Shields Arsenic Green. For some reason, green was all the rage back in Victorian times. I'm not sure why. I'm personally not a fan of green, but except for the green screen. We love that. I know you guys can't see that, but I love, I love the green screen. When I was a paint mixer, sometimes people would bring up the wildest colors for me to mix, and they weren't for art projects. They were for walls. So weird, but I digress. There was a common color back then called Shields Green. It was made in a lab by a spooky, scary Swedish guy named Shield. Huh, go figure. This color was used in everything, dresses, fabric, paint, you name it. The trouble is, it was a compound of copper and arsenic. Therefore, it was toxic and caused a lot of harm. It also had links to cancer. For example, when Napoleon was banished to St. Helena, the walls of the house he was staying in were painted with shades of shield. Eee, that's not good. Pretty sure he died of stomach cancer too, so there's a connection there. Number eight, beetle dresses. Like I said, the green color was really in at the time, and there were other ways of achieving such a gorgeous glow besides using shield paint. Similar to how Cleopatra made her eyeliner, some dresses in Victorian times were made with pieces of beetle. Ugh. I'm sure there are some folks out there who probably don't mind that, but for the rest of us that don't care for Halloween or My Chemical Romance and Tales from the Crypt Keeper, hard pass. Basically, any beetle or colorful bug that wings, or I guess caprices, was worth keeping was prepared and sewn into fabric. The finished product doesn't look like it came from creepy crawlies. It actually looks kind of good, to be honest. Mind you, this is a time when a lot of things were still done by hand, so there's a little bit of love in each beetle you stitch. That's kind of nice. Mom, mom helped out with that one. That was nice. Number seven, wearing black for weeks. Losing a family member is tough. Life can get hard. In Victorian times, passing away was a big deal. There was usually a big funeral, flowers, tears, everything, the whole works. The crazy part is, you were expected to wear black or mourning clothes, as they were called, thought to be an outward expression of one's emotions and feelings. However, it's not like that one funeral of the distant uncle you had, where as soon as you got home, you ripped off your suit and hopped on Call of Duty to see what your friends are doing. Oh, on the contrary, my ninja diffusing friends, because in Victorian times, your search and destroy matches would require you to wear those black mourning clothes for a long time, sometimes even weeks and months on end. Queen Victoria wore hers for years after her husband passed, and it was odd to see her in anything but black. That's a weird story. That's crazy. Number six, Annaline Dye. In 1856, William Henry Perkin was trying to create an anti-malaria drug using aniline. After all, the British were spending an awful lot of time in foreign nations doing as the British do and needed a cure to keep doing what they do. Well, he did not find a cure for malaria, but he did discover it makes a very lovely dye that makes deep reds, purples, and black, you need that for the funerals. Naturally, this picked up a lot of steam and began to be used in everything from socks to shoe polish. Yeah, I know, right? Trouble is, once people got enough exposure to the clothing with aniline dyed, their skin would go red, itchy, inflamed, and was known for causing really bad headaches. That's because it would absorb to the skin and poison their blood. That sounds pretty <laughs> Actually, I don't, I don't want that. Number five, zinc chlorine coats. This one's bad, man, but it was stopped before it became a trend, thank God. Picture this, it's Victorian London London and you're but a humble city servant. Your job is to clean the streets. One night it begins to rain, as it is known to do in England. I hear it rains there a lot, I don't know. And the city provides these humble men with coats that have a zinc chloride layer in the fabric. It was supposed to protect against rain and, and wetness and whatnot. A lot of chemistry in this video, but 
Some might already guess that this was a bad idea. Zinc chloride is not only corrosive, but water soluble. So after a shift in the rain, a lot of these men came back with really nasty chemical burns. And no, they didn't have emergency showers like in Heisenberg's RV. They didn't have that. Or your high school chemistry class it was really bad. They stopped it immediately because that's really bad. Number four, asbestos fabrics. Chris will like this. He'll remember these. Picture this. It's 2004. It's Saturday afternoon and your dad just got finished watching an episode of Trucks. Nice. And now you have control over the TV remote. Saturday morning cartoons, here we come. I used to love the Kirby show. He's one of my favorites. Love that guy. But just before you change the channel, there's a commercial with an old man who looks very concerned and he says have you been affected by mesothelioma and or because of exposure to asbestos then you may be qualified for compensation I believe it went something like that maybe I should call Saul Goodman where's he when you need him all jokes aside those commercials were not joking they weren't joking around at all because it's been known asbestos was very harmful for a long time so yeah it was pretty bad Victorian times were no different, mostly using things to protect from heat or fire, and while it did do the job somewhat, it was very harmful for the lungs, and like the old man says in the commercial, it could be cancerous, hence mesotheliomia. I, I said it right there, I said it the first time when I was impress impersonating him, and now I can't say it. Mesothelioma. There it is, mesothelioma. Number three, radium makeup. Okay, sure. I'll give you that radiation and radioactive materials were pretty much being discovered and barely understood for the time. Okay, sure. It was new. Look at Madame Curie. Tragic story there. So when the very interesting radium was discovered, it got thrown into everything because, yeah, why not? Radium makeup, radium watches, you name it, radium was in it. While at first exposure to radium, you'd be fine, not too much to worry about. However, after years of direct physical contact on the skin, yikes, there's going to be a problem. It's radioactive. It's the reason why you shouldn't get too many x-rays. Not that it's radium, I'm just saying radiation in general is not good for you. Not much to explain this one except it was used and manufactured in women's makeup and they used it. And I, I'm sorry, that's just, that's just rough. Number two, mercury hats. Mercury was nothing new in the medical field in Victorian times. It had been used in ancient China for a long time before that. And yes, it was poisonous. It was harmful too. However, in Victorian times, some hats included mercury in their production process. Now, why is that so bad? Well, because mercury makes you go insane. Hence why they called it Mad Hatter's Disease. I could not think of a worse name for a disease. Now, not that it's a fashion point, but this was also readily used for treating syphilis at the time. So something that's readily available for the public and health would wind up in closed production. It makes sense. If there's a lot of it, sure, it makes a lot of sense. But it makes people go crazy. That's, sorry, who's talking to me, what? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> joke, funny. Number one, cellulose nitrate. This one's crazy. As you can tell on this list, there's been a lot of clothes and fabrics mixed with some naughty chemicals. Naughty. Of course, this is years before OSHA or Wemyss, so yeah, it probably wouldn't happen today. However, this one takes the cake. When cotton or a cotton-like product is introduced to nitric acid, it forms cellulose nitrate, which is also known as flash cotton. Not because it takes its shirt off at an edgy concert, but because I can't cannot stress this enough how unstable and flammable it really is. Even the slightest heat source could set it off. There's even stories of people spontaneously combusting after being exposed to items made with such. The lights in the studio, they'd probably set it off. That's how, that's how sensitive it is. That's pretty crazy. <sighs> More sensitive than your first day to prom, you know what I'm saying? Number 10, Albert. Adam, how is Queen Victoria's marriage to Prince Albert bizarre? Well, my little honeybees, not to be a pessimist, but it's bizarre because they actually really did love each other. Uh? Be honest, how often do you think it occurred that people of royal or noble birth actually got to marry someone they genuinely loved? On February 10th, 1840, Queen Victoria married Prince Albert of saxe coburg gotha who, interestingly, was her first cousin and who was actually kind of not the favorite of the British people who saw him as an outsider. As queen, she was the one to propose. Good for you, Queen. Literally. The couple stayed married for 21 years until Albert died of typhoid in 1861. And together, the couple had nine children. Nine. Even after his death, Queen Victoria continued to make ruling decisions based on the principle of what would Albert do? It's such a nice way to start this heinous list. Number nine, Napoleonic Wars. 
Okay, a little bit of a stretch, but I would argue the Victorian era lasted from about 1814 to 1914. There's no specific date, but it could be classified around this time. The Napoleonic Wars were essentially world wars started by one man. The Corsican Ogre. Hello. Imagine having the whole world against you. No, really, the whole world against you. Britain, Prussia, Russia, Austria, and sometimes Italy took part in the coalition wars, which were just part of Napoleon's story. Trust me, this dude was arrogant and he was the antagonist of the story. He's been labeled as the greatest tactician ever. When it was all said and done, he had rediscovered ancient Egypt, fought many battles, and managed to become emperor. And he got banished twice. Eight, mummy unwrapping parties. What is your favorite idea of a get together? Let me know down below, I won't judge, I promise. Unless of course you say mummy unwrapping parties like some people in the Victorian era might have. Then I will indeed judge you. Thanks to the Napoleonic Wars making their way to Egypt, interest in the country was on the up and up. And while people have been buying mummies since the Elizabethan era, now these rich weirdos bought even more, bringing them back as souvenirs. Once they got to the homestead, they would almost instantly hold parties with all their rich friends where they would unwrap their mummies like a Christmas present. Congratulations! It's exactly what you thought it would be! A five or six thousand year old decaying corpse that smells horrible. Why are rich people like this? I, I don't get it. Number seven, Fire Hazard Christmas. Like all families at Christmas, we all have our traditions. I'm a good boy all year, so Santa can bring me lots of gifts. Thanks, Santa. My family tradition is to watch the National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation every year. I love that movie. Adam, on the other hand, well, he's a bad boy, and he eats all the chocolate out of his advent calendar before it's time. Don't tell him I said anything, though. No. I can't help it. I'm sorry. <laughs> he's right there. However, one family Christmas tradition was quite popular back in Victorian times, oftentimes called Snapdragon. Uh, the basis of this game was to get a large bowl, fill it with dad's brandy, and drop some large raisins in said bowl. Next, get a candle or a match and uh, light it up. Now that there's a large cauldron of flaming liquid and fireballs in your living room, now your objective is to try and knock the raisins out of the dish without getting burned. Fun for the whole family, why not? Just be mindful, you know, that the whole house is made of wood and there's no fire alarms and there's no modern firefighting equipment and everyone's wearing long gowns and you get the point. Number six, maybe we were apes? November 24th, 1859 marks the day that none other than Charles Darwin published the famous and even infamous On the Origin of Species, presenting his theory of natural selection and questioning the theory of creation. Truly a great day in my opinion. Look, we can talk evolution versus creation in the comments, but there is no denying the evidence presented in On the Origin of Species had people turning heads and questioning everything they thought they knew. Its full title, on the origin of species by means of natural selection or the preservation of favored races in the struggle for life kind of explains it. But basically, Charles' book gave us the idea that species evolve over generations through the process of natural selection, which he backed up with evidence from the Beagle expedition in the 1830s, which to my disappointment had nothing to do with the dog breed beagles. Number five, the potato famine. The potato, so rugged, so versatile. Think of all the ways you can prepare a potato. Boiled, broiled, baked, mashed, pan fried, deep fried, french fries, hash browns, latkes, and sometimes you can put them in soup or stew. Usually pretty cheap and filling. The food of peasants and I love it. However, during 1845 Ireland, a fungus outbreak was taking hold of potato harvest all over the country. Thus creating a large famine that would see over one million people perish in a famine. Queen Victoria tried to help but was ineffective. And by help, I mean the same effort I put into reaching for the TV remote that's too far away on a lazy Sunday. Number four, body snatching. Look, back in the day, making a buck was not so easy. Some people who had absolutely no morals went this route. Basically, you wait around for a recently vacant grave to be not vacant. And before the soil can settle, you remove the inhabitant of said grave and go to your local university and say, Right, I've got this here fresh non-mangled corpse, give me some money and it's all yours. And Bob's your uncle, you are now the very bottom of the barrel, the tritus of human existence. But hey, you made some moolah and can afford to eat your next meal. Honestly, while you may be the worst of the worst people, it's partially the doctors and schools that are to blame for even accepting these fresh, illegally exhumed corpses for study in the first place. 
It may not sound like a specific event, but um, some people dressed up for it, so there's that. Number three, the tube in it. The London Underground, baby, the world's first subway. Which, let me tell you, it's kind of annoying living in Canada when you have two very popular franchises that share two common names for a rapid underground train. Metro and Subway, right? It's so annoying. You Google Metro and Subway and then the grocery store comes? I never have that. Okay. That's, maybe it's that, a me thing. It's a me that's thing. Tunnels underneath the city and trains travel through it. It's simple. Well, the first one was opened in 1863, which is an engineering feat to say the least. And it feels like forever ago. I mean, that's older than Canada for crying out loud. When you think of the Victorian era, you think horses, carriages, top hats, and orphans asking for more gruel. Mind you, the locomotive was different from a modern one, but this is a very modern idea, especially considering that there's no cars yet. Kind of a weird thing. Number two, the telephone. On March 7th, 1876, Scotsman Alexander Graham Bell got a patent for his invention of the telephone. Three days after acquiring the patent, Mr. Bell made his first phone call to his assistant, Thomas A. Watson, saying, Watson, come here, I want to see ya. And that was that. And we've gone downhill ever since. No, I'm, I'm just kidding. The telephone is a huge groundbreaking invention, allowing people to communicate across vast distances. But the phone addiction some of us have to deal with now, man, it's rough. Alexander Graham Bell was born in Edinburgh, Scotland, and the whole reason he became interested in the idea of creating the telephone was because of his mother, who was deaf, and his father, Alexander Melville Bell, who was a teacher of elocution, and was famous for the phonetic transcription system he had developed to help the deaf learn to speak, which is really quite sweet, actually. Number one, the war to end all wars. Out of all my research about the Victorian era, the start was somewhat muddy. Maybe because historians don't want to take away from North American or Napoleon history. But the end of the Victorian era was more clear. 1914, the war to end all wars. This was the big one, folks. A mixture of militarism, imperialism, alliances, and a power struggle uh, made for a powder keg that ended up exploding in 1914. Unlike a lot of wars, this one actually changed things. Empires fell while others got stronger. Countries on maps were being redrawn. Others stayed the same. But the culture? Well, it changed too. What did it? I'm not sure exactly, but what I do know is that when sitting in a wet, freezing, muddy trench for months on end, well, that's horrible, especially when the only thing you have to look at is a red paste that used to be your comrades. It was not a good time. And it made a lot of folks go a little, you know, a little crazy. Starting our list off at number 10, the first postage stamp. Uh, uh, uh. Nice, who's the first guy who licked the stamp? Why'd he do it, right? We'll start off with stamp facts, why not? I know there's a couple pen pals out there that still use snail mail, that's cool, this one's for you. May 1st, 1840, the world's first ever postage stamp was sold, of course, for one penny. Pretty cheap, nice, we love it. The sale changed history. Now on the stamp was of course a portrait of one Queen Victoria, world's first ever profile photo for a letter. Here we go, they're like, oh, who's this? Who's this little person here? Of course this caught on, definitely caught on. More than 70 million letters were sent within the next year. And then that tripled only a few years later. And of course it thrived for 40 years. Do you still use letters? If so, write into us, write some fan mail. Forget the comments, write into us with a pen, with your autograph too, where you live. Yeah, no one's doing that anymore. Number nine, Alexander Graham Bell. I have no idea how phones work. I know it's vibrations and signals and I have to do this occasionally to help it out, but scientifically, nothing. I can't wrap my brain around this technology. Still, I'm 28 years old and I have YouTube, couldn't tell you. If I was set back in time right now, I wouldn't beat Alexander Graham Bell. I would just watch him and wouldn't change history one bit. Guy's a wizard. On March 7th, 1876, Alexander Graham Bell received a patent on his invention the telephone, and just three days later, he made it work, somehow. The world's first phone call was of course to his assistant, Thomas Watson. Now I'm from the generation that had T9, and I thought that was bad. I also didn't have that, you know, one of these, where you have to like, go around and around a bunch of times. T9 was way worse than anything. You have to Morse code message all your friends. Ugh, we have it too easy today. Never forget about Alexander Graham Bell. Hit that thumbs up on your smartphone for Alexander Graham Bell. How, how does it work? Hello? 
Number eight, Queen Victoria's death. You may have heard the phrase, the sun never sets on the British Empire. Sounds very Westeros, doesn't it? Sounds like the British Empire is in an alternate universe or something, I don't know. But this is meant in a literal sense. On January 22nd, 1901, the Victorian era came to a close, of course, after the death of Queen Victoria herself. She passed away at age 81, and Queen Victoria was succeeded by her oldest son, King Edward VII. Now, at this time, the British Empire literally took up more than one-fifth of all of Earth's land. So the sun actually did not set on the British Empire. It's a real phrase. It's not just a fun bit there. Number seven, Queen Victoria's eighth child. First of all, eighth. Kudos. Here's a fact that we don't talk about enough. Let's do this. First of all, I have no idea what it's like to give birth. I hear the comparisons and what it feels like, whatever, and it makes me want to faint. It's like peeing a watermelon or something like that. It's, I'm gonna faint just talking about it. The fact that you can endure this pain is beyond me. And the fact that you want to as well, Kudos. Now imagine being the queen and having the public, like everybody, talk smack about you and how you decide to give birth for the eighth time. Yeah, April 7th, 1853, Queen Victoria decided to use chloroform as an anesthetic delivery. Now everybody at this point, that you know wasn't a scientist, they were sure to voice their opinions on the matter. It was a huge controversy, although this act directly spread the awareness of this medical advancement. I mean, yeah, it sounds, you know, they're like, yeah, don't do that. But can you do that? We don't really know. We're eating bread. Number six, grave bells. Oh, this one gives me chills. Here we go. In the late 1700s, cholera, bacterial infections, and anything and everything was spreading. It was not an ideal time, wasn't very safe. Many were biting the bullet at this time, sadly, of course, being gravely ill. But with this came a dark trend, the safety coffin. Yeah. Just a backup coffin. These coffins, Lord forbid you are buried alive, these safety coffins would allow the dead to rise again. Nice, like it's Michael Jackson's thriller. They would just come up and be like, oh, oh, oh guess who's back? Back in the Thames, here we go. All these coffins have extra comfort on the inside and a wire. This wire ran through the coffin and then attached to a bell on the outside, on the you know ground floor. So if a passerby or heard it, well, thy would know something's up. Folks would get creative with their safety coffins. I mean, you know, they'd personalize it. Like for example, a man named Robert Robinson from Manchester. He passed in 1791, but instructed his family and watchmen to open this special door that would reveal a layer of glass. So that's real haunting to find. Hey, come look at grandpa. Yeah, he looks good, eh? Patent number 81,437. It was actually granted to Franz Vester in 1868, and it was an improved burial case. Just a glass case with someone who may or may not be alive inside. 50-50. It had an air inlet, a ladder, and of course, a bell. The description of the patent says, if too weak to ascend by the ladder, they can ring the bell, giving the desired alarm for help, and thus save themselves from premature death by being buried alive. So now I ask you, if you're walking in a graveyard and you heard a bell ringing, what, would you just start digging and be like, ah, I think I heard something. I don't know. Let's just disrupt the skeleton. Number five, gym day. Believe it or not, they were around 200 gyms all across Europe during Victorian times. Dudes were getting shredded. Why not? They're like, hey, we don't have dinner, but might as well just work out. These gyms weren't bright. They weren't open. They weren't well ventilated, motivating, safe. None of those things that you need today. No, Victorian gyms were reserved for the upper class. Uh, yes, of course. Grab your pocket watch and your blazer, Ezekiel. We're doing some bench pressing today, I guess. Yeah, grab your monocle for sure. You're going to need that. These machines also, they were not ideal to work out. They were designed as antiques first, rather than, you know, their fitness purpose and safety purpose also. Like, half these look like saw traps. There's no way I'm gonna be bending my arm around any of these Victorian devices. Even the machines today at the gym, I'm like, no way, no thank you. Weak gang, here we go. Number four, beauty patches. Okay, we have to bring back beauty patches ASAP. Imagine like if a rapper had a beauty patch. Nelly had the band-aid, but we gotta have like beauty patches. We gotta like, you know, mix it up a bit. Bring back the facial feature game. These patches came in all shapes and sizes, of course, in the Victorian era. Even in this portrait from 1755, Joshua Reynolds painted Charles, the ninth Lord Cathcart, rocking a large beauty patch. That looks amazing. He does look like Nelly, honestly. He has like that motivational, like rapper kind of like, you know, he, he's, he's in charge and you can tell from the beauty patch. It's like that that's a lord right there with that one of those. Take it off, no lord. Put it back on, lord. The reason for these patches back then and sometimes having more than one is because they were commonly used to cover up smallpox scars. They were made out of silk, velvet, and they were applied with glue. So pick a spot and commit. It's gonna be there all day. These patches were dark black and they were meant to make your pale skin pop. Of course, pale skin back then made everyone faint. 
pale, pale skin and long shoes. Everyone losing their minds. The position of these patches can also determine your political allegiance. How funny is that? Historian Joseph Addison took note of these positions when he observed two parties from the 1800s. Now one party had patches on the right side and the other had the opposite. It's pretty, pretty amazing. It's a pretty easy way to flip jerseys, right? The other team starts winning. You're like, you know what? Check it out. Now I'm on this side. Prove it. Number three, chimney sweep. Ah, terrible jobs, here we go. I remember when I was younger, I had to sweep the chimney in the house and I loved it. I thought it was cool. I thought it was like a little safety, like secret room. I don't know, it wasn't safe at all actually. It was just a dirty room. Had a little broom too. I always loved using that little broom. Little tiny sweeps, one at a time. Little tiny bag to go along with it, so gentle. This was a terrible job to have in Victorian London, obviously. Chimney sweeps were famously young as well. I can't say anything else there, but these guys were Young lads, history is horrible. Maybe that's why I was doing it, right? Because I could fit inside of the thing, that makes sense. 1840 was a good year, all things considered. A law was passed that made it illegal for anybody under the age of 21 to climb in and clean a chimney. I was 18 cleaning my chimney. I had no idea, I could have used this great law and got out of the whole chore, shame. Number two, Jack the Ripper. Unidentified to this day, who is he? How did he get away with it? And also, when are we gonna see a Netflix documentary on this guy? We have everybody else in this multiverse of killers. Where's this guy? We're gonna complete the image. Well, it's because we didn't find him. Jack the Ripper was active in the East London neighborhoods, primarily, and sadly, he would target sex workers at the time. He famously took the lives of five women from August to November of 1888, and they were believed to have been connected to Jack the Ripper, although some sources claim that he was active until 1891. It's hard to tell who's who and who's doing what. Again, this is also so long ago. There's no cameras. Hard to catch someone. Many believe Jack the Ripper had some anatomical knowledge due to the way that he left his victims as well, which is creepy. While there were some suspects, including a member of the British royal family, believe it or not, Jack the Ripper was never identified, so. Yeah, that sucks, really. We gotta find him. Can't, but we gotta. And finally, number one, mudlarks. Yeah, we'll get dirty for this last one here. Why not? Victorian London around the 1840s, it was a bit of a mess. Everyone was sick, a lot of sore throats, to say the least. The jobs that were available, they sucked. They certainly didn't help you, you know, survive. The jobs that were available had you catching rats and crawling in a sewers. One of the worst jobs to have was that of a mudlark. Now, as the name hints towards, a mudlark involved getting in deep in the mud and muck that would build up alongside the Thames River. Yeah, that dirty river back then. They're like, yeah, just go through the, the lining of that. See what's in there. Ugh. This one was reserved, again, for the younger folk with, you know, the, uh, the, the patellas that still worked, you know, digging in the mud, of course. Can't have an old guy in there. He's not gonna come back out. It was like working in quicksand. It was horrible. It was exhausting. Not to mention the chances of being whisked away by the river at any given moment. Yeah, it sucked. All for the slim chance of finding a pocket watch or some driftwood, rags, something, anything really worth your troubles. Number 10, mummy unwrapping parties. This is, uh, yeah, pretty disgusting right off the hop. During the Victorian era, there was a fascination with ancient Egypt and the practice of mummification because they didn't have Netflix back then, so people gathered to do this. Mummy unwrapping parties were a popular social event where wealthy individuals, they would purchase, well, mummies, and then gather with their friends and family to unwrap them, just slowly unwrapping a person. That's disgusting. These events were often held in the privacy of their own homes or museums and were viewed as a form of entertainment and education. Both, no. Definitely not for both. Guests would gather around the unwrapped mummy to inspect and marvel at the preserved body. However, these events were controversial as they were viewed as disrespectful and unethical by many and if not all people around them. As these mummies were often obtained through questionable means. Yeah, how does that guy end up in London? You know, a pharaoh is now in London? That makes no sense. For sure not where he died. Definitely not where he died. The trend eventually came to an end as archeologists began to push for more, you know, respectful treatments of ancient artifacts and real people and their remains. What kind of purge party is this? What are we doing here? Can we go home? Number nine, your skin can breathe. This, yeah, I don't know, we were all frogs. Little did I know. During this era, there was a widespread belief among scientists, like real scientists, that human skin could breathe. Similar to how lungs inhale and exhale air. Yeah, we could breathe through our skin. That's, that's a fun one. This theory was based on the idea that the skin has pores that allowed oxygen to be absorbed and carbon dioxide to then be expelled. As a result, some people would wear looser clothing and avoid tight corsets to allow their skin to well, breathe more easily. Literally, to allow you to breathe more easily. That's so gross. However, this belief was eventually debunked as it became clear that the skin does not actually function like a set of lungs. 
Ha! Who knew? Not me, that's for sure. Nonetheless, the idea of skin breathing persisted in popular culture and language for many years after. You know, there were some believers that are like, no, our hands are breathing. You can breathe through our hands. Number eight, crotchless undergarments. While it may sound shocking, crotchless underwear was indeed a part of Victorian era fashion. It was most common for women, however, it wasn't intended to be scandalous in any way, shape, or form. Rather, it was a practical solution to the difficulties of wearing heavy petticoats and, well, corsets while still needing to use the restroom. Gotta undo a lot of stuff. At first, you're like, eh, this doesn't sound very good. Yeah, it makes quite practical, I guess, if you all have to wear nine duvets as a dress. It's pretty practical. Though it may seem strange to modern sensibilities, crotch's underwear was a functional and necessary aspect of Victorian fashion. But it was also hiding a little secret. Number seven, hair. Hair everywhere. Yeah, legs, body. You couldn't see anything, so you didn't have to shave anything, right? That's it, problem solved. During the Victorian era, it was not common for women to shave their legs or their bodies at all. This hadn't been invented yet, I don't know. The concept of hair removal was considered inappropriate, actually, and it was considered to be associated with the lower class. Yeah, so keep it, keep it thick. Women's clothing at all time was designed to cover most and all of their bodies, which meant that their hair was usually not visible. Nice. Moreover, using razors or other hair removal methods was also considered too bold or even unhealthy back in this era. See these creams back in the Victorian era, they were quite unsanitary. It was one thing putting it on your face, but removing hair and tender other areas, that of course could lead to infections or other health problems. It wasn't until the 20th century that hair removal became more accepted and even popular especially with the rise of shorter hemlines and more revealing clothing. Yeah, we'll shave it up a little bit, sure, why not? Number six, lice everywhere. Lots of hair, therefore lots of lice. They go hand in hand, sadly. During the Victorian era, lice were a significant problem due to poor hygiene and living conditions. Lice infestations were common among both the rich and the poor, so there's no getting away from this one. Many people suffered from itching, rashes, and infections caused by these little nasty parasites. Families had to use various remedies such as vinegar and kerosene in any attempt just to try and kill these little suckers. Some people needed special combs to remove lice and their eggs, gonna throw up, from their hair. Now, despite efforts to control the eggs and the lice problem in their scalp, the problem persisted throughout the Victorian era. It was tough, right? It wasn't until the early 20th century with the, you know, improved hygiene practices and the development of insecticide that lice infestations became less common. Yeah, we, we missed that. We were almost buggy in our hair. Close. Number five, bleach mask. Madame Rowley's toilet mask. Where do I begin with this one? It's kind of fun, kind of terrifying to look at. At first, I thought this was a mask you had to wear to go to the bathroom, but no, that would have been a bit better, a bit cooler. Just a Jabberwocky mask for no reason. Compared to everything else on this list, I was like, sure, people would do that. Why not? A toilet mask was a natural beautifier for bleaching and preserving the skin. Even removing complexion imperfections. Yeah, all that happening under one Jason Goldie mask. What a treat. What a miracle, rather. You'd only have to wear it three times a week and then, voila, you were beautiful. Turns out, lead cosmetics pasted onto a mask and then onto your face three times a week. That was not beneficial for your health. Yeah, who knew, right? Ah, smelled so healthy. We didn't end up looking younger. We ended up poisoning our faces all in the name of beauty. But just wait, it gets worse. Number four. Toilet troubles. Ah, the bathroom, another dangerous reason why we can't use it. Victorian era was unsanitary, to say the least, but it was also dangerous in ways that you wouldn't expect. One of the greatest Victorian inventions was the bathroom, but it took a few tries to figure out the whole methane gas problem. Spontaneous combustion of the bathroom was weirdly common, and now I have a new fear. Flammable gases like methane and hydrogen sulfide, they would build up over time in and around human waste. Human waste would build up over sewers and eventually would back up into your home in that era. So, next thing you knew, you're lighting a candle and, well, your bathroom and your entire life is gone, just like that. And you didn't even get to go to the bathroom. That's it, it's the worst part. Number three, hot, dry summers. In the summer of 1858, London was hit by a severe heat wave, causing the Thames River to dry up and then release a strong odor of sewage and rotting matter and feces. Anything that's in that water is now just sitting out and about. So you can only imagine. The stench was so unbearable that it made people sick. It disrupted businesses in the area. It was a real problem. The problem was caused by a lack of sewage treatment facilities and of course raw sewage being dumped directly into the river. Well, that sure didn't help, did it? The sting drew public attention to the need for better sanitation and prompted the government to invest in the construction of a modern sewage system. It had to get really stinky before we solved it. This event marked a turning point in the history of public health in London and led to significant improvements in sanitation practices that helped to prevent the spread of disease. So again, had to get really bad before it got 
better. I was gonna say not great, but better. Number two, weird Christmas cards. Number two. Weird Christmas cards. During the Victorian era, there wasn't much to give your loved one, right? You can't give them a Nintendo Switch Lite. You're like, hey, here's a picture of a frog doing a tango. That's all I got, that's it. The practice of exchanging Christmas cards became popular during this time. These cards would feature colorful illustrations of winter scenes, nativity scenes, other festive motives, you name it. Whatever they could tell stories of, they would draw it in really weird, wacky ways. The tradition began in 1843 when Sir Henry Cole commissioned an artist to create a card for him to sent to his friends and his family. Now the cards were expensive, but were initially only affordable for those wealthy folk. But as printing technology improved, they became more widely available. So score, now you get to tell your loved ones how you actually feel with a wacky guy playing a tambourine. Victorian Christmas cards often featured sentimental messages and elaborate designs, and they became an important part of the holiday season, where we get it from today. All that pressure to write a little something something comes from that era. Today, vintage Victorian Christmas cards are highly collectible and are appreciated for their beautiful full artwork, beautiful, I guess, artist subjective, and its historical significance is rather amazing. I don't know, if you have one of these, don't throw them out. Don't make fun of them, just frame it and then sell it for a million dollars in like 10 years. There you go. And finally, number one, beauty patches. In the Victorian era, beauty patches were a popular trend among women of high society. There were these small black patches that were applied to the face as a way to accentuate certain features and draw attention to the wearer, the pale Victorian complexion. The patches were made of silk or velvet and were often cut into fun shapes like hearts, stars, or crescent moons, right? It's like the scene kids back then, they're like, mm. <laughs> They were typically worn on the cheek, forehead, or around the mouth. You can get creative, right? It's your face. Have at her. Beauty patches were also believed to have medicinal purposes, with some claiming that they could cure headaches or improve one's complexion. Both absolutely false. No medical science around that. Despite their popularity, beauty patches were eventually, sadly, phased out of fashion by the early 20th century. Starting off this list, in our number 10 spot, we have the Tichborne case. This was quite a bizarre legal case that captivated Victorian England in the 1860s and 1870s. It involved a claimant named Arthur Orton, who alleged that he was was the long lost heir to the Tichborne baronetcy. Despite numerous inconsistencies in his story, Arthur managed to convince some members of the Tichborne family and a significant portion of the public that he was who he claimed to be. The case went to trial in 1873 and it became a media sensation with thousands of people lining up outside the courthouse to catch a glimpse of the proceedings. This was basically like the Victorian era's OJ trial or the Johnny Depp and Amber Heard trial, you know? The people wanted to know. Despite Arthur's conviction for perjury, the case continued to fascinate the public for years to come, and it became a symbol of the era's fascination with sensationalism and fraud. The Tichborne case remains one of the most infamous legal cases in British history, and is a cautionary tale about the dangers of believing in something without sufficient evidence. In our number 9 spot today, we have the London Beer Flood. This sounds like it would be quite a fun time, but it was anything but that, and instead it was a tragic event that occurred occurred on October 17th, 1814 in the St. Giles District of London. At the Mew and Company Brewery, a massive vat containing over 135,000 gallons of beer suddenly ruptured, causing a wave of beer to flood the surrounding streets. The torrent of beer destroyed several nearby houses, killing eight people and injuring many others. The flood was so powerful that it even knocked down the wall of a nearby pub, trapping and killing some of the patrons inside. The London beer flood was caused by a combination of factors, including poor construction of the vat and overfilling it with beer. The brewery had a history of safety concerns, and many of the workers were aware of the dangers associated with working there. Despite this, the brewery continued to operate, and tragedy struck. The incident became the subject of much media attention at the time, and it continues to be remembered today as a tragic and bizarre event in London's history. The victims of the flood were commemorated with a plaque on the site of the former brewery, and the incident has been the subject of numerous articles articles, books, and even a stage play. Not sure the logistics of that one though. In our number eight spot today, we have the Victorian bicycle craze. This is a name to refer to a period of intense enthusiasm for bicycles that swept across Europe and North America in the late 19th century. The introduction of the safety bicycle with its chain driven mechanism and rubber tires made cycling a much more accessible activity for the general public. It became a popular mode of transportation and leisure activity, particularly among the middle 
middle and upper classes. The craze also had a significant impact on fashion, with women's clothing becoming more practical and comfortable to allow for cycling. It's funny to think of now because like, it's just a bike, but at the time it was so much more than that. It's like how smartphones completely changed our lives in more ways than we probably even know. That's basically what the bike was like in the Victorian era. The bicycle craze had a profound impact on society and culture at the time, it led to the development of new industries such as cycling clubs, and it also paved the way for the modern transportation industry. The bicycle became a symbol of freedom and empowerment, particularly for women who were able to travel further and faster than ever before. The Victorian bicycle craze remains an important cultural and historical phenomenon that changed the way people lived, worked, and played. In our number 7 spot today we have the Crimean War. The Crimean War was a conflict fought between 1853 and 1856, primarily involving Russia and an alliance of France, Britain, the Ottoman Empire, and Sardinia. The war was fought over various territorial and religious disputes, particularly regarding the rights of Christians in the Ottoman Empire. The war was marked by high casualties, particularly from disease and poor medical care, and it is often seen as a turning point in military medicine. The war also featured some of the first extensive use of modern technologies such as telegraphs and railways which greatly impacted warfare in the future. The war ended in a victory for the allied forces and it resulted in a significant shakeup of the balance of power in Europe. It also demonstrated the need for improved communication, organization, and medical care in military conflicts and it had significant long-term impacts on military and political strategies in Europe and beyond. In our number 6 spot today we have the East End Outbreak. The East End Outbreak was an outbreak of cholera in 1866 and was a major epidemic that struck the densely populated area of East London, causing widespread illness and death. Cholera is a highly contagious disease that spreads through contaminated water, and in the Victorian era, London's water supply was notoriously unsanitary. The outbreak was particularly devastating in the East End, where poverty and overcrowding made residents more vulnerable to disease. The outbreak led to significant changes in public health policy and infrastructure, as well as increased public awareness of the importance of sanitation and hygiene. The physician Jon Snow, which you know feels like a weird name to say when I'm not talking about Game of Thrones, but the physician Jon Snow played a key role in identifying the source of the outbreak, tracing it to a contaminated water pump on Broad Street. His work really paved the way for the development of modern epidemiology and disease prevention. The the East End cholera outbreak remains a significant event in the history of public health and the struggle for social justice. It brought attention to the urgent need for clean water and adequate sanitation, and it helped to spur reforms that improved the health and well being of people in urban areas. In our number 5 spot today, we have the London Burgers. This is the name used to refer to a notorious of body snatchers who operated in London in the early 19th century. They were involved in the illegal trade of selling corpses to medical schools for dissection and study, and they would often resort to killings to obtain the bodies. The most infamous member of the gang was William Burke, who along with his partner William Hare, committed a series of killings in Edinburgh, Scotland in 1828. They sold the corpses to the anatomist Robert Knox, who was unaware of their methods. Two of the group's members, John Bishop and Thomas Miss Williams were convicted of killings and sentenced to death. The London Burger scandal highlighted the demand for fresh corpses for medical research and contributed to the passage of the Anatomy Act of 1832, which allowed for the legal procurement of corpses for medical purposes. Emphasis on the legal part of that, though. Important. In our number four spot today, we have the Great Stink of London. The Great Stink of London was an environmental disaster that occurred in the summer of 1858. It was caused by the city's inadequate sewage system, which allowed raw sewage and waste to be dumped directly into the River Thames. The hot weather only exacerbated the problem, which is disgusting, and it caused the sewage to ferment and emit a foul odor that permeated the city. The smell was so overwhelming that it caused widespread illness and forced many people to flee the city. Parliament was forced to act, and a major engineering project was launched to build a modern sewage system for London. This project was led by engineer Joseph Bazalget, who designed a system of sewers and pumping stations that would carry sewage out of the city and into the Thames estuary. The construction of the new sewage system was a massive 
massive undertaking involving the excavation of miles of tunnels and the construction of large pumping stations. It took several years to complete, but once it was finished, it greatly improved the health and hygiene of the city. The Great Stink was a turning point in the history of public health, and it helped to spur major improvements in sanitation and public health infrastructure across the developed world. Today, the legacy of the Great Stink lives on in the modern sewer systems and wastewater treatment facilities that are really essential for maintaining public health and environmental quality. In our number three spot today, we have Typhoid Mary. The Typhoid Mary case is a famous incident in the history of public health in the United States. Mary Mallon, also known as Typhoid Mary, was an asymptomatic carrier of the bacteria that causes typhoid fever, a potentially fatal disease. Despite being unaware of her condition, Mary inadvertently infected numerous people during her work as a cook in New York City in the early 1900s. After a number of typhoid outbreaks were traced back to Mary's cooking, she was tracked down and forcibly quarantined for several years. The case generated significant controversy at the time, with some arguing that Mary's civil rights had been violated and others maintaining that public safety justified her isolation. The Typhoid Mary case remains significant for its implications for public health policy and for the balance between individual rights and public safety. In our number two spot today, we have the Birmingham riots. These riots took place in 1839 and they were a series of violent clashes that occurred in the city of Birmingham, England. The riots were sparked by tensions between two groups, the Chartists, who were calling for political reform and greater democratic representation, and the authorities who opposed the movement. On July 4th, 1839, a group of Chartists held a rally in Birmingham's Bull Ring, where they were met with opposition from local government agencies. The situation quickly escalated into violence, with protesters and authorities engaging in brutal clashes that lasted for several days. The Birmingham riots of 1839 were significant for their role in the history of the Chartist movement, and it is said that the events of 1839 demonstrated the lengths to which authorities were willing to go to suppress the movement. And finally, in our number one spot today, we have the Brown Dog Affair. This was a controversy that arose in the early 20th century in London over the use of animals in medical research. In 1903, a statue of a brown dog was erected in Battersea, which had been used in vivisection experiments by a scientist named William. William Bayless. If you're unfamiliar, vivisection is defined as, quote, the practice of performing operations on live animals for the purpose of experimentation or scientific research. While I am all for the advancement of science, I do believe in ethical studies, and this clearly was not that. The statue was intended as a memorial to the countless animals that had been used in medical research, but it was met with outrage from some people. Anti-vivisection groups saw it as a symbol of animal cruelty, while some medical researchers saw it as an attack on their work. In 1907, a group of medical students attacked the statue during a protest, sparking a violent confrontation with anti-vivisection activists. The statue was eventually removed by authorities, but the controversy continued to rage on for many years. The Brown Dog Affair highlighted the deep divisions in society over the use of animals in medical research and contributed to the development of new laws and regulations aimed at protecting animal welfare. Rule number 10 is going to be follow the moral encyclopedia. For ornery young men and women desperately desiring physical and emotional intimacy, yet having to navigate a dating culture that required them to act a certain way, well, it meant self-help books were all the rage. And women in particular drowned in them, thanks to the fact that these books were often written by hypocritical men and had been used since for medieval time to dictate and instruct women on how to become the perfect submissive little doll. Some examples are Henry Butter's ominously titled Maiden, Prepared to Become a Happy Wife and Mother from 1868 and Hayden Brown's Advice to Single Women from 1899. Perhaps most famously though on advising the morals of young women was the Moral Encyclopedia by Charles Barl, which had been making young women hate themselves since 1861. It was a bestseller of its day thanks to the marketing that only decent and morally driven women would own it. To prove themselves as that woman, Victorian gals flocked to the bookstores to absorb some menial patriarchal crap that goes as follows. Read no novels, but let your study be history, geography, biography, and other instructive books. Also, trust no female acquaintance, i.e. make no confidant of anyone, because we don't want you ganging up together. Um, I mean, possibly breaking your feeble tongues, having a conversation. Oh, and if you get a pimple, expect nobody to ever love you again. To quote, remember that whereas the character of a young lady is considered angelic, and blemish in it would withdraw the respect men have for you. Rule number nine is to follow a handbook of etiquette for ladies. Following on a similar sales tactic of gaslighting, only 
perfect and honorable women know all the rules of etiquette. Oh, you don't? Oh, well, that's such a shame. Now you lose all your honor. You know, though, I can help you out. It's pretty convenient that right here behind me, I have this book I wrote and it has all the rules. I mean, I can give it to you so you can restore your honor if you give me like $30, I don't know. So what's in this immensely popular bestseller from the 1860s that bullies women? Well, I'm so glad you asked. First up, keep that bling to a minimal mamas as you should never wear mosaic gold or paste diamonds. They are representative of a mean ambition to appear what you are not and most likely what you ought not to wish to be. You got a problem with that? Well, sucks. Pipe down because it's better to say too little than too much in company. Let your conversation be consistent with your gender and age. Don't forget to never talk about yourself either as such discussions cannot be interesting to others and the probability is that the most patient listener is laying the foundation for some tale to make you appear ridiculous. If you do open your mouth and your choice is to be a dirty joke, girl BFF because a double entendre is detestable in a woman especially when perpetrated in the presence of men. No man of taste can respect any woman who's guilty of it. Oh, my personal favorite. Did you break something while a guest in someone else's house? Nah. As a lady, you can't do that. It's not possible. Pretend like nothing ever happened. Don't own up to it and gaslight your host. About another's house, should you break anything, do not appear to notice it. Your hostess, if a lady, would take no notice of the calamity, nor say, as is sometimes done by ill-bred persons, oh, it is of no consequence. Consequence. Rule number eight is having a dress for all occasions. Should you not? Well, that's not proper etiquette. As a middle or upper middle class Victorian woman, your job was to spend your day like a brat stall, changing every few hours. This is because of the strict etiquette of the time, which dictated that certain dresses were for certain activities, which meant you had to plan your errands around your outfit changes that made it possible for you to run your errands. Isn't that fun? Women would start with the morning time dress, which was relatively comfortable by Victorian standards. However, for us, it would still feel like wearing an iron reinforced tube sock on our entire body. It was simpler in appearance and designed for only the home. Want to take a stroll in the park? Out of the morning dress and into the walking dress. The skirts are shorter by several inches and didn't have a train, so they weren't dragging a leaf pile behind them as they went. The materials were usually rich in color and pattern to be admired amongst the greenery. When women returned home from their daily walk, they would change in dress number three, or the afternoon dress for receiving visitors or visiting others. The skirts had a longer train and the neckline was usually a little lower. After some visiting time, dress number four gets whipped out for dinner and it was the most formal of all casual dresses. Usually silks, satins, velvets, exactly the type of precious material you wanna spill food on. Ball gowns weren't for regular wear, but they were required for fancy occasions so you had to own them too. Rule number seven is to mourn properly. Another dress all women owned was an all black morning dress. They kept these bad boys unlocked for whenever someone died, which was arguably something to look forward to in the Victorian era. Thanks to Victoria being the most extraordinary and dramatic woman of all time when her husband, Prince Albert, died in 1861, and she spent a bajillion years dressing like a vampire and wearing black mantillas, it set this bizarre fashion and mourning standard that metamorphosized into literal rules. If one was to ignore these rules, it was seen as incredibly offensive to the deceased. Self-help books dedicated to making men and women better at exerting dramatic woe were pretty common to see on bookstore shelves. So, a mourning rule for women was should her husband die, the widow was expected to mourn for no less than two years, while mourning for parents and offspring only lasted a year. Relatives such as grandparents and siblings would only get six months. They dole it out like family inheritance is a little weird. Queen Victoria had favored black crepe, and it became one of the only fabrics that was permissible for mourning clothing. Luxurious silks and satins weren't permissible, only itchy and abrasive materials that chafed the sadness right into you. Women would often wear merino or cashmere instead. No jewelry or ornamentation was permitted unless it served a functional purpose like a button or a clasp, or unless it was a bunch of the deceased's hair and teeth braided in a pattern together in the jewelry. Don't forget your big black hat and grandma's doily tablecloth you dyed black to throw over your face and body. Enjoy looking like a corpse for two years. Rule number six is to glove up. We love to joke about the whole, oh no, if you show your ankle, you're a Victorian W word. But weirdly, hands were actually way more of an issue. The ankle thing was just because men were still trying to look up women's skirts, even when they were so long, the ends of them entered a room 15 minutes after the wearer did. Fingers were actually oh, the gasp-worthy thing of the day. It was considered highly inappropriate to walk in public spaces with uncovered hands and would draw a lot of ill repute to those daring damsels who did. In fact, women's hands were so scandalous, both written and unwritten rules of Victorian etiquette unanimously agreed that if a man and a woman happened to be walking on an unevenly surfaced road, it was the one and only time that he 
could take her hand if they were unwed. Funny that the only permissible contact between the couple the yet to be engaged is to prevent her needing to be picked up from a Victorian pile of mud sludge. It does not matter where you are headed outside of your home, you must wear gloves, which weren't just a popular fashion accessory, but as stated, social necessity. Like every other item a woman could wear in this era, there were many kinds of gloves based on the occasion. For example, daytime was for short gloves, which usually bore designs, embellishments, whereas in the evening, gloves had feathers, satin ribbons, and other super flammable decorations. Rule number five is the modest dip. Because we're on the topic of acceptable fashions and modesty, a Victorian woman taking a dip at the beach pretty much looked the same as four burly men sitting in an ice fishing hut in Alaska. First of all, this was something only middle and upper middle class people could really do as it required money. You had to rent bathing machines, which looked like outhouses on wheels, but were really covered carriages that drove through the shallow water of the beach. There was a hole in the bottom that the ladies could stick their legs into or sometimes submerge their whole body, but that was ill-advised, not because the water was filthy, which it was, and riddled with corpses and poison to boot, but because creeps could come swimming up and see your bare legs. Can't afford the traveling outhouse? Well, no beach for you. Rule number four is wife sales, a real legal way to obtain a divorce in stuffy Christianized England. Divorce was unpopular, detested, and openly deterred in those days. Seeing as you were discouraged from intercourse with your partner, married them when you barely knew them, and could barely spend time alone with one another, it was a pretty popular request. You would have to sit listening to the clock tick and his nose being clogged, but him not blowing it for the 444th night in a row while you disassociate staring into a fireplace. What the hell did people expect, of course you want out. You don't even know his middle name. Attaining a divorce in the early 1900s was an expensive undertaking, however. So those who couldn't afford the legal fee sometimes sold their wives to the highest bidder. It was often done with the full consent of the wife, who was usually bought by her family, a new lover, or a female friend. It was an amicable way to say, this was a mistake, get out of my house, good luck and prosper. Rule number three is no flirting. As stated, you were really not supposed to flirt, and flirting to the Victorians included eye contact, talking to one another, looking at another person, breathing their air, knowing their name. Maybe the last one is dramatic, but you get my point. You wanted someone, you had to wait until you met them four or five times, then you could look at them, run into them a couple more times, then maybe request a dance at a ball, and you get one of those a couple times, then maybe you get a sit down chaperone visit, maybe a walk in the park, and a couple more ball dances, then you can propose. But even then, a Victorian maiden could not be trusted alone with her fiance, lest her dainty, fluttering hand rest on the arm of her intent and cause an outburst that would inflame the fiance's uncontrollable base lust. Even after progressing through several stages of acceptable dating, aka the ball dancing, talking, walking together at a distance, if a man was invited to the woman's home, their acquaintanceship would still have to be under the watchful eye of a chaperone. Single women were never to indulge in behavior with a man that might lead to being kissed or handled in any way. This included strict inspection rules, because I kid you not, men were encouraged to inspect a woman back then. Like many of the stipulations that accompany shipping procedures. How romantic. If a man wanted to admire a necklace, the woman would have to remove it, hand it over for inspection. Under no circumstances was the item to be inspected while she wore it. Now I know where that flirting tactic came from because guys, y'all love that whole jewelry admiring flirt and it isn't subtle. And of course, during the chance encounters in one's club or in the park, staring boldly at someone you knew without acknowledging him or her, known as cutting, was the ultimate display of bad flirting manners in Victorian times. Guess they didn't like them bold back then. Rule number two is coming out. Not like that. Coming out in Victorian times meant a woman was tired of being in her parents' house, and if she wanted out of it, it meant she had to go find a semi-tolerable guy whose house she could move into in return for a cool ring on her left hand. This had to be a whole big announcement because to attend such events that a woman needed to to meet a potential suitor, she required the explicit permission of her mother. Only after stating her intent could the chaperones be organized because she can't go alone. Think of Bridgerton. Rich families might accompany the announcement with a series of parties or even a royal visit. Middle class families might hold a celebratory feast. Lower class families might not formally celebrate the announcement at all. Instead, the young woman just changed her appearance to show availability. This could be putting up her hair, donning a long dress, and accompanying family members to social events like church service, church dinners, festival balls. Coming out was best done during the in season, a literal term. It meant the four months from April to July where the upper class families up and down the country would send their teenage daughters to London. After flocking there en masse, the upper classes would congregate a series of balls and dances for the purpose of meeting, matching, and reproducing the next generations. At these events, the race was on to find someone with whom to make love. Again, this phrase of which whose meaning has changed considerably over 
time. Making love in the Victorian age meant seeking out someone who might one day come to love you. This was done by eligible bachelors going up to girls' chaperones, giving them a little card, requesting a dance with her. Her dance cards would be stacked in queue order in which the men got their dances and they were only allowed three per woman. End of the night rolls around and our maiden will choose if she liked a suitor and have her chaperone return the card to indicate, oh yeah buddy, it's on. Rule number one is how to travel, aka how not to have fun. Here's your duties when you're traveling as a Victorian lady. Listen up, take notes, dress appropriately. This is usually a dress similar to the morning gown, lighter and easier to move around in, but most importantly, plain and understated with few details. They would accessorize with dark leather gloves, straw bonnet, and of course, a travel corset, which was apparently said to be much less restrictive. Pick your seat carefully. It was customary for a woman traveling alone to choose a seat either next to another woman or an elderly gentleman. Women traveling alone were seen as prime targets for pitpocketers and thieves. It was usually only done to poor women without chaperone options, but all women, rich or poor, were instructed to keep only a small amount of customary spending cash on their person and give the bulk of their dough to their driver or escort to keep safe. Speak when spoken to, as only men were allowed to spark conversation with a lady, never the opposite way around. Women were expected to respond politely and accept invitations to the refreshment saloon, even if they didn't want to go. That's because of the next rule. Never ever be rude while traveling, especially alone. It was imperative a woman act with the utmost class, even if being accosted by a persistent male passenger. But make sure you don't pester him. If a woman is traveling with a male companion, it's not appropriate to ask him such questions as, when do we get there? How far is it? You know you're making the wrong turn. Yes, you are. I know you are. I've been this way before. Look, that was the wrong way. How much time do you think that wrong turn added? Do you want to stop and grab something too? Yeah, no, strictly forbidden. Can't do that crap. But don't forget, you're also a babysitter to the because if the lady's male chaperone accidentally wandered into designated female compartments, it was her fault for either inviting him into the quarters or not alerting him of the specialized area. And lastly, while traveling, don't check yourself in. If a journey requires a stop at a hotel along the way, the lady would remain in the carriage while the driver or escort took care of all the room arrangements, likely because it was unheard of for a woman to make such a decision on her own. Number 10, tool skirts. Tool skirts were a major problem. Although these were chiefly worn by ballerinas, ballet has always been a destructive form of dance when it comes to basically how it affects the body. I mean, many ballerinas literally have their toenails fall off as a result of dancing on point. That's just kind of like an assumed part of the profession if you're dancing point. However, we aren't even talking about the feet here. We're actually talking about how safe the costumes are, the literal garments they dance around in, not even their shoes or their feet. The answer to that question, they're not very safe. Considering that before electricity, many danced on candlelit stages, you'd likely be horrified to hear just how flammable these costumes were. There are many examples throughout history of ballerinas and dancers getting too close to candle flames while in their costumes and basically lighting on fire. And I gotta say, I've listened to multiple podcasts that have talked about this, so I could recommend some to you. If you want some, let me know in the comments. I'll send them your way. Emma Livery is by far one of the most famous ballerinas though to have caught flame. She actually did initially survive the incident, but she died eight months later as a result of her injuries. That sounds terrible. And there were honestly countless others who suffered similar fates. The really terrible thing is back in the day, this is something new that I found out, we actually had the means to make fire retardant costumes. but. They affected the aesthetic of the costumes, making the costumes appear a little bit more stiff. So rather than try to save the more than thousands of ballerinas who died in even just a single year, we decided to opt for beauty over safety. To me, that's pretty scandalous, I'm gonna be honest. Scandalous and disappointing. <laughs> And friends, before we move on to our next spot on this list, if you love what we do here at Bumblebee and you love learning history with us, be sure to let us know by clicking that subscribe button. Honestly, we got a lot of fun facts for you and I don't want you to miss out. Number nine, showing some shoulder. Ooh. <laughs> The crazy thing is we actually just came from an era before this when showing shoulders was actually considered very fashionable. But by the time the Victorian era really started to kick into gear, this was actually considered completely improper. Paintings even had to be repainted to reflect this new trend because showing a bit of shoulder literally frightened some people. They were like, oh, I can't look at it. Repaint that painting, cover those shoulders up. 
not joking, that's a real thing. And don't even get me started on cleavage. Shoulders were previously considered to be something beautifully showcased from gowns that had both lower and wider necklines. This was considered beautiful and sexy in a good way. But with puritanical views taking over anything considered too beautiful and definitely anything considered sexy would be seen as bad and sinful. So we had to cover those shoulders up. <laughs> Man, if I traveled back to the Victorian era right now, they'd be like, girl, what you doing with those shoulders? Sorry, my shoulders and my ankles are out today. Oh, scandalous. Number eight, the gall dress. While Marie Antoinette was not around during the Victorian era, living and dying just before it began really, her presence was felt in regards to the mark that she left on the fashion scene. Marie Antoinette was often seen as a woman of scandal, not just because of the stories of her love affairs and her actually being misquoted here as responding to the poor, starving people of France by saying, let them eat cake but also because of her fashion sense. While by today's standards, Marie Antoinette would be seen as probably being overdressed among us, by her time standards, she was often seen as presenting herself as immoral, with many of her dresses resembling more undergarments of the day than the usual more modest finery and typical style. Case and point, a portrait that was done in her chemise style dress, known as a gall, by painter Vigie Le Brun, was condemned for how it portrayed the monarch. People actually admired Le Brun's work in terms of the painting itself, but didn't like the dress that she had painted the queen in, as they felt it appeared too intimate and informal. As a result, the painting was actually removed from display and Vigie was forced to repaint Marie Antoinette's dress into something more formal and fitting. Because it was just it's too risque. We were like, we can't look at the queen like this. It looks terrible. Repaint it. <laughs> I don't know why I'm making everyone British when we're in France, but there you go. <laughs> Number seven, fainting room. By today's standards, fainting rooms might seem quite scandalous. And while they were very fashionable back in the day, often being linked to corsets, at least so we think, in reality, fainting rooms actually had less to do with corsets and more to do with people's desires to nap without having to bother with all the business of undressing, getting in bed, getting back up, having the bed remade, and completely redressing. Instead, fainting rooms were a place where you could sneak off to for some peace and quiet during a busy afternoon or major social event or simply a place you could just go to rest for a bit without having to do the whole sleep time ritual that usually accompanied, you know, going to bed. What's more scandalous is the fact that the women who were known to actually faint back in the day, that is true, and even today, women still faint, people still faint, had this malady attached to corsets by physicians. Usually, of course, men back in the day who simply just didn't know what was wrong with these women to make them faint so much. So what did they do? They blamed corsets, of course. Although to be fair, corsets are notoriously bad for your health. But still, I just love that these doctors were like, I don't know what's wrong with this woman. Corsets, they make her faint, that's what it is. Probably iron deficiency, heat, being overdressed in the heat, there's a lot of reasons why people faint. Number six, Shields Green. This dye color became super popular in the Victorian era, but is also known for being literally made out of poison. If you're worried that women of the day didn't know that at the time, uh, nah, they were actually informed on this, yet they still chose to wear this color because, I mean, it was simply too gorgeous. Hey, it's worth it. A little bit of arsenic poisoning, no problem. It did cause symptoms of arsenic poisoning among those who wore the dresses dyed with this color because I mean, it's dye, it's, this fabric is still rubbing up against your skin, still getting absorbed through your pores, but it actually caused even more harm to those who made and dyed the garments with it. Cause you know, they're the ones actually breathing that in and stuff. Yikes. Number five, bloomers. Bloomers were one of the first styles of pants women gravitated towards in the Victorian era. They were worn in rebellion of the often unruly skirts of the day, which made it hard to move around and well, honestly, probably do anything. Female cyclists instead preferred to wear bloomers, causing much scandal as people felt it was improper for women to dress so masculinely. How dare you? Basically, bloomers are like more floofy pants 
pants is how I would describe them, and people felt that pants should be reserved for men to wear. Even the floofy ones. They were like, women can't have any pants, not even floofy pants. I gotta say, I would totally rock some Victorian era bloomers and be causing all the scandals myself if I were around back then. They definitely look more comfy than pretty much almost everything else women were wearing. The bloomers got their name from a prominent American feminist of the time, Amelia Bloomer, though she herself did not invent them, but she was a person that basically spoke out and was like, I, why can't women wear pants? Although Amelia Bloomer did fight hard for women's rights, she herself is not someone I believe we should just straight up glorify, to be clear. She also said some pretty terrible things about Native Americans, and she also seemed to be content with civilians taking the law into their own hands and literally hanging people deemed undesirable in their community, so it's a big yikes from me. Number 4. Corset Corsets didn't originate in the Victorian era, but they definitely became iconic in regards to the fashion of that time period. That's because slim waists, they came back into fashion, baby. They also became iconic for the fact that they were causing great damage to the people wearing them. Well, I too do love to don a corset from time to time. It is important to make sure that you don't push it when you're wearing them, and it's important to remember that this extreme form of shapewear literally has a history of moving people's insides around as a result of wearing them daily or even just regularly. Honestly, even me wearing it every now and then is not good for you. Just corsets aren't good for you. So, even just wearing a corset, you know, every now and then, it's not good probably shouldn't do it. I probably shouldn't do it, but am I going to do it? Yeah, probably. And even back in the Victorian era, when they were trending again, we knew that corsets were bad for you. And it made this item quite the risque one, despite it at the time being coveted and widely used by many out there. That was actually like even a topic back then. People were like, shouldn't people be wearing these? This seems dangerous. Number three, flashing. Some ankle. <laughs> can't see it on camera, I can't show it to you because it'd be too scandalous, so scandalous. As silly as this sounds now, especially with it being summer right now, as I'm talking about this, a time when being underdressed is really just being comfortable. This was, in fact, a huge thing in the Victorian era. Women were often covered head to toe from the top of the neck all the way down to the ankles. It was common for women to even wear multiple long skirts and stockings in an attempt to just fully cover their legs and ankles. So those who decided to flash a little bit of ankle with their fashion choices, woo, they were considered quite risque. Number two, hoop skirts. As deadly as they were definitely fashionable during part of the Victorian era. The hoop skirt, also known as caged crinoline, was a type of skirt that was built like a cage. There's various different ones which were made out of different materials, but the idea is it's literally a big hoop cage that you wear and then you put a dress over top of that, or a skirt over top of that. The idea was to add volume to the bottom of your outfit, which would also help to make your waist look even slimmer. Something that was very fashionable back in the day and something still coveted by many in regards to modern beauty standards today. Hoop skirts though were deadly because you would often misjudge the size of your skirt, which could cause all kinds of accidents. Also, many of the materials used to build the hoop skirts and dresses that went over top were very flammable. Many people died from catching fire or getting their skirts caught in machinery or even carriage wheels. So yeah, don't wear a hoop skirt if you have to do anything or be, be near flames or just be alive in the Victorian era because there were open flames like everywhere. <laughs> number one, the one piece. I like that I saved this one for number one. I didn't realize I was doing that, but I knew subconsciously. The one piece swimsuit created quite the controversy when it, it came into fashion near the end of the Victorian era. And the really wild thing is it initially pretty much covered almost like your entire body. But, and it's a big but for this era, it was very fitted. So because it hugged the body, as swimwear really should do so that you can, you know, actually swim, it was considered to be quite scandalous. Not only that, but of course the one piece also wanted to maintain your modesty by not having your skirt float up in the water around you, giving everyone potentially a free show. So it was fashioned to be pants, you know? Oh boy, a woman in pants without a skirt? Scandalous. How dare, how dare these women try to swim? <laughs> 
We didn't say women could swim. Someone put a law so that these women can't swim. <laughs> Get them out of these swimsuits. In 10th place, we have deadly party games. So back in the day, board games weren't the massive industry they are today, and Victorians loved their parlor games, even more so when they risked their lives doing it. Because, you know, why not? One such game was called Snapdragon and involved pouring raisins into a bowl, soaking them in rum, and setting them on fire before scrambling to remove as many raisins as possible and chomp them down while they were still aflame. Because, you know, why not? Another game was called Hot Cockles, and I couldn't make all of this up if I tried. Blindfolded and with your head in someone's lap, partygoers would take turns kicking you in the rear end, and then you uh, had to guess who it was that kicked you. This sounds not only uncomfortable from the start, but like it could quickly get out of hand, and my tailbone hurts thinking about it. Yet another game was called Cellar Stairs, and involved walking backwards down a flight of stairs using a handheld mirror as your only guide. Supposedly, the features of your future mate would appear in the mirror, but it seems more likely that you would just, you know, fall down the stairs, and I know I would have. My balance is not the best. Finally, there's the Candle and Apple game, sometimes called Snap Apple. The game was so popular in the 18th and 19th centuries that Halloween was often referred to as Snap Apple Night. Candles and apples would be hung from the ceiling, and the goal is to get a bite of the apple without consuming any wax or getting burned. As a former altar girl who used to play with wax, youch! I can't imagine just how much that would hurt my face. Also, I think I found where uh, Ready or Not got its inspiration. In ninth place, we have hats made from taxidermy birds. Not gonna lie, I'm not the biggest fan of taxidermy, even though I have a friend who has a museum in his home that has more than a few pieces. Granted, he mostly focuses on albino taxidermy. But hey, to each their own. What began as a few plumes from herons, jays, and you know, pheasants tucked into the brims of headwear became a wildly popular trend, which the fashion industry capitalized on by going to the extreme, adding entire taxidermy birds to very tall hats, as well as stuffed hummingbirds to decorative hand fans. According to the Victorianist, millinery fashion took a truly bizarre turn in the 1880s, when hat crowns grew tall, offering a generous display area for, in the most extreme examples, an extraordinary array of animals, including cats and squirrels. I I don't even want to imagine the amount of flies that would be circling, you know, around hats that was still a trend in today's world. How warm things are thanks to global warming. Also, I rave for neck health since I doubt those hats were very light, and as someone who has worn a couple of very heavy wigs in my lifetime, they tend to take a toll. In eighth place, we have Victorian death photographs. So photographs of loved ones taken after they died may seem kind of morbid by today's standards, but in Victorian England, they were a way of commemorating the dead and blunting the sharpness of grief. Remember. Unless you were rich enough to have a painting commissioned, there really wasn't a way to preserve visual proof that someone existed and how they looked for future generations. In images that are both unsettling and strangely, you know, fitting, families poised with the dead and consumptive young ladies elegantly recline. The disease not only taking their life, but, you know, increasing their beauty. Victorian life was full of death. Epidemics such as diphtheria, typhus, and cholera scarred the country, and from 1861 onwards, the bereaved queen made mourning fashionable. Trinkets of memento mori, meaning remember you must die, took several forms and existed long before Victorian times. Long exposures when taking photographs meant that the dead were often seen more sharply than the slightly burned living, because of their lack of movement. On some occasions, eyes would be painted onto the photograph after it was developed, which was meant to make the deceased more lifelike, while other times death was a lot more obvious. Locks of hair cut from the dead were arranged and worn in lockets and rings. Death masks were created in wax, and the images and symbols of death appeared in paintings and sculptures. But in the mid-1800s, photography was becoming increasingly popular and affordable, leading to memento mori photographic portraiture. Try saying that five times fast. The first successful form of photography, the daguerreotype, was an expensive luxury, but not nearly as costly as having a portrait painted, which, like I said before, that was the only way you could do it first. As the number of photographers increased, the cost of daguerreotypes fell. Less costly procedures were introduced in the 1850s, such as using thin metal, glass, or paper rather than silver. Pricey, pricey silver. In seventh place, we have uses for arsenic. Pardon me, uses other than ending lives. But you know, that also makes me want to consider a top 10 creative ways to dispose of people. Martha Ponder. Arsenic invaded almost every aspect of life in 19th century Britain, leaving a tool of death and illness. A byproduct of an emerging smelting industry, arsenic was cheap and readily available as rat killer by uh, the early 1800s. It was also odorless and tasteless, and easily confused with flour or sugar or other cooking essentials. By the mid 1800s, 1930s, morbid descriptions of death from arsenic terrified the public and became a staple of the British popular press. But most of the fatalities from arsenic were more pedestrian. From accidental use in food or from exposure to arsenical compounds in consumer goods such as fabric dyes and wallpapers, in facilities that meet these products, and in the polluted air. Arsenic was used even in medications to treat everything from asthma and cancer to reduce libido and skin problems. Now, Victorians were just as obsessed with their bodies as we are, if not more dangerously. Many women used arsenic to fight wrinkles, and men swallowed arsenic tablets as kind of a pre-Pfizer Viagra. It's unclear if arsenic can actually be used to um, turn compasses to true north, but it doesn't seem advisable to try it. 
I feel like there are much safer ways to get a uh, motor running, if you will. In sixth place, we have wasp wastes. We all know that corsets were a thing in the Victorian era, but they were much more extreme than most people might think. Many women cinched themselves down until they had very tiny wasp waists. With super snug corsets that didn't just rearrange your insides, they made it impossible to breathe. Now, before anyone starts calling all corsets or stays awful to wear, they're only bad for your health if you're trying to accomplish the above improperly. As a gal who corsets often for fashion and posture purposes, I've only ever experienced discomfort when they weren't properly fitted, like when, or when I was wearing them for too long, or when I was wearing the combination of a too small steel boned one outdoors in the cold for too long. But this is a do as I say and not as I do kind of situation, since that was like a one time thing and my ribs have very much learned their lesson. Long story short, corsets are not bad, you just have to wear them properly. You trust me, right? In fifth place, we have grave robbing. Now, my first thought when I said that just now was Grave Robber the character, which only goes to show how much repo the genetic opera has wrought in my brain. One of the most lucrative side hustles of the Victorian era was grave robbing. And the fresher the corpse, the better. Medical students needed cadavers to study. So a black market of corpses arose, enriching adventurous thieves and uh, angering families of the dearly departed. The 19th century was also a fertile age of exploration. One of the most impressive discoveries were ancient mummies that the people of Victorian England brought home from Egyptian vacations. They'd invite all of their friends over for unwrapping parties, which tended to be rather grim spectacles that nevertheless delighted the morbid weirdos. Look, while I don't condone it, I wouldn't mind time traveling back to be a fly on the wall at those parties, since I I definitely classify myself as a morbid weirdo. At one notable gathering for the unwrapping of Nescons, the second wife of Theban high priest Pinogem II was placed in a contraption that made her appear to dance. The demand for mummies to take home was so high that Egyptians started transporting them from less visited ruins to areas that had a lot more traffic. Hey, whatever helps the economy. In fourth place, we have garden hermits. So the next time somebody shows off their garden to you, make sure to ask where they keep their hermit. And if they don't have one, make sure to comment on how undignified it is. In the Victorian era, wealthy families hired people to don full hermit garb, complete with robes, long hair, beards, and hermit glasses, and live as an ornamental garden hermit on their land. The biggest rule of all though, no speaking to anyone on the property. And honestly, sounds like a dream job to me. Ugh, being paid in house to not speak to anyone and just be like a silly little decoration feature? Sounds like upgraded background work, and I will totally take it. Granted, that's if someone wants like a spooky ooky gothic garden feature. I'm all yours. In third place, we have shock treatment. No, I'm not talking about the cursed as all get out sequel to Rocky Horror, but more people should be. I've only watched it once, but it does have some bops for sure. In the 19th century, Victorians thought electrotherapy could fix everything from gout to muscle problems. All you had to do was pay your local electrotherapist who shocked the problem area, but really all it did was leave a lot of people with icky scars. In more modern times though, it has been refined to work well for muscle issues, but it uh, wasn't always that way. In second place, we have weird face masks. Patented in 1875, Madame Raleigh's face mask was strapped to a woman's head overnight, three nights per week. That was how you do it, you followed the rules. Made of flexible India rubber, the mask could be filled with unguents and all manners of salves and bleaches to uh, treat the skin. However, the mask did have a second purpose, which was to make the face sweat all night long. Also called the face glove, the device would excite perspiration with a view to soften and clarify the skin by relieving the pores and the superficial circulation. Inventor Helen Raleigh claimed the mask could be used by persons suffering with certain forms of disease or afflicted with a bad complexion, which came in the form of cutaneous eruptions, blotches, pimples, freckles, or fugitive discolorations, and for clocked pores and capillary congestion. So, a uh, cure-all? Now, this mask became very, very popular and uh, led to some market competition. One improved overnight mask was made of flannel, while another complained that existing masks didn't allow for poisonous gases to escape, so she proposed layers of chamois and satin. And hey, if all else failed, Victorian women layered raw beef or veal over their faces before bed. I love a good face mask as much as the next person, but um, I think I'll stick with what I already know. In first place, we have corpse medicine. The Victorian era ushered in the tail end of corpse medicine, which was the practice of ingesting different parts of the human body to cure various ailments. One popular drink to cure apoplexy mixed powdered human skull and chocolate, while the most coveted remedy mixed skull with uh, booze to each their own. By the 19th century, most doctors had uh, moved away from this barbarous practice, but medical texts and cookbooks that explained you know how to best repair a body part suggested that it was far from uh, dead. To get fresh supplies, people often went to an executioner rather than a pharmacist, paying good money for the freshest of fresh products as recommended by a doctor that was shockingly not accused of being a vampire. I even found a recipe for uh, red fluid marmalade. Yeah. 